with uh, with CDC guidelines, fully vaccinated individuals do not need to wear masks or be socially distanced. But we can only ask that unvaccinated or unknown vaccination status individuals wear masks uh, and maintain six feet of social distance. Today, the CAC members will be participating uh, from uh, either in Albany or the New York City location, where the public is also able to view, as well as the webinar uh, to allow broader access across the state. I'll now hand it over to Farah Anderson from Cadmus to walk us through the procedures for today's meeting before we dive into the agenda. Great, thanks, Sarah. Um, so yeah, we just, as we are in this hybrid environment, wanted to ensure that we have as smooth of a meeting as possible. Um, so just wanted to remind particularly those who are um, joining us virtually today and participating uh, verbally in the meeting to please uh, make sure that you are muted when you're not speaking um, and to please um, ensure that when you would like to speak that you, you know, raise your virtual hand if it's um, not part of uh, the planned events. Um, for those who are joining in the room to please turn your placards uh, sideways so that uh, those monitoring where questions are in the physical rooms can be aware of who all has questions and help um, monitor the flow so that we have again a, a smooth meeting. Um, so with that, I will um, pass back uh, to you. Back to you, Sarah. Back to you, Basil. Okay. <laughs> uh, Hi, everybody. Um, so you all have the agenda in front of you. We start with the consideration of the minutes. Um, Jordan and I will share some brief remarks, very brief. Then we'll get into a, a, um, a presentation from the Climate Justice Working Group on the advisory panel recommendation, in particular the power agenda panel. And the first, uh, we'll get the first series of presentations on the hard and analytical work being done uh, behind the scenes on um, test support and decision making on the silver plan. Uh, so first, let's move to the minutes. Uh, you all received in your email as a write-up from the last meeting. Uh, any discussion on that? Any questions on that? All right. So nothing on the minutes. Can I have an approval on the minutes? Okay. Second. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Okay, you guys have it. Uh, we'll do just a quick uh, cycle around the room for everyone to say hello since it's been a long time uh, since we've been together. Person, start us off. Commission. Good morning. Good afternoon. Marie Therese Dominguez, Commissioner of Transportation. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Yvonne Martinez. Hello, everyone. Once again, Dennis Nelson Beck, President of Green Friend. Good afternoon, Mr. Ball, Commissioner of the City of Garden, Larry Marcus. Nice to see Basie. Hi, everybody. Peter Ibonowitz. Hello, oh, great to be here in person. I'm Bob Howard. John Howard, Chairman of the Public Service Commission. Sarah Austin. Say it. Brian Harris, nice to meet you. Carl Marks, nice to meet you. Ann Reynolds, allow us to bring that into the work. And I sleep off the Department of Health. Sarah, state representative. Adam, Donna Carlos, Sean Fieldgast, Mark Wanda. Adam, how did you get? Yeah, I've been you, uh, President of the Department of Health. Regent of the Council of the State 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 Samir, do you want to say hello for this? Uh, hey, I'm Samir Lanerne, Climate Justice Advisor for the Climate Action Council. Nice to meet you. Welcome to your state. Thank you. Yeah. Great to be here. Great. Um, well, welcome, everybody. Uh, we'll take uh, some time, as I said, to ask you Yes, sir. Oh, people are New York City. City. Very nice. Let me just switch easier on Zoom. <laughs> uh, in New York City, Raya. Thank you, I'm muted. Ryan Salter, Imagine Power LLC. Well, want to say hello? Oh, 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 o
And Rose Hardy, Regional Plan Association in New City Parks. Anna Chaco, Long Island Power Authority. Kevin Hansen, Empire State Development. Okay. Thank you. Is that it? All right. Where was that? Um, back to our brief remarks and reflections. Uh, just to uh, some a few moments when we talk about the national and international events uh, going on in town, in particular. The federal level, uh, the uh, fairly dramatic shift in the federal government's attention to climate uh, and climate action is uh, certainly welcome here at the state level, in particular the recent uh, progress with uh, the President's Justice 40 initiative, uh, which in many ways uh, aligns with some of the work that we're doing and becoming a good area in New York State. So uh, anytime we can get the federal government uh, to, to uh, align with the states, it's a, a huge plus for all of our efforts. Um, just a quick note, if you change the slide here. Um, um, a quick note on, on extreme weather. Um, I think it's relevant, it's relevant to what we're talking about today. Uh, we went through about 18 months of the coronavirus, and um, the, maybe the first major Unifying event that touched every single human being at the same time. And we all went through it together. We're all going through it together right now. Um, I think climate is is doing the same. Some of us may uh, acknowledge it, uh, some may not, but nonetheless, we're all going through it at the same time. This great change in what's going on here. And just looking at the science, it's not just looking at the anecdotes, but the science. And seeing what's what's actually shifting around us right now, I'll put up a few photos there. Certainly, we all know. Sorry, uh, in the U.S. here, record heat uh, in, in the western part of the state now record wildfires. We have DC uh, forest ranger out there helping fight fires, and what I've known about northern this summer, uh, record drought, this so-called mega drought, which may become the new normal. In New York here, the rainiest uh, July, I'm going to tell you all the rainiest July ever, um, as well as a uh, yellow sky that we all woke up to a couple mornings ago, and uh, the worst air in New York City in 15 years since the wildfires in the West. In Europe, uh, we're then going through Germany and Belgium in particular, and what's happening in China at the same time as a result of, potentially as a result of the guest in Germany. And this is, don't forget, right before we met, the first time, 12 meetings 13 years ago, with record fires in, in Australia uh, with the droughts that preceded that. So I, I put that up there um, because I can say, I think with some authority at this point, that we're certainly in a climate emergency right now. And um, we have this golden opportunity here in New York based on the climate law that uh, Governor Stein and legislature passed and you all worked on uh, to lead from the front and certainly take alignments from other states uh, to the U.S. Climate Alliance and elsewhere. Uh, Welcome the federal government's leadership uh, on this as well. So we want them to uh, cruise past all of us and, and make this a national issue if they should. Um, markets are aligned uh, or aligning with uh, technology is down on uh, living grass. So we have this opportunity. Uh, I hope we take advantage of it. I think we will with the energy in the room. And I know that there's millions of people behind us waiting for us to do the right thing. So. I just want to say that you know, we all see the news every day, uh, making it so clear that this is no problem. So, with that, uh, up with the news, Doreen. Thank you. And uh, next slide, please. Certainly, it is true. Climate change is a question of whether it's here or not here. It's here. As we look at our work, it really needs to be built in that, um, in that context, even as we redouble our efforts together. Um, to address these impacts. If we go back to slide, um, I always have to talk about our investments. Um, and we had, sorry, back one slide, please. What's your problem? Oh, here. Sorry. Is it any better? Yeah. Okay. So my job is always to talk about investments, and that's really what we seek to achieve. Um, the photo that you see here is a ribbon cutting at an event in battle. Not far from the site of Woodstock, where we celebrated Lieutenant Governor Hochul 
um, hitting our three gigawatt uh, milestone for solar installations in New York City. Uh, well ahead of our New York Sun uh, goal of six gigawatts by 2025, and really indicative of what the clear market signal and what the scale of a program like New York Sun can realize with not only the scale, but again, of the 2100% growth, but also 69% cost reduction. That's really what we need to do with many, many, many other technology services. <laughs> that event was great. Uh, but indicative of really the need for scale and other respects as well. In addition, as you can see here, um, we had a couple of exciting announcements in the building space. Uh, a good example of where we need scale first to go community networks, um, which are critical to realize more than building by building investments in electrification. And then further, an investment in multi-family low carbon solutions, um, another critical component of our climate strategy. And I think indicative and important for today's uh, discussion of the Power Generation Advisory Panel um, announcements and investments and reflection by the Climate Justice Working Group is our uh, findings of a real need for long duration energy storage to realize the grid of the future. Um, a robust, resilient, and reliable grid of the future. So we at NYSERDA issued our first long-duration energy storage uh, program opportunity notice, putting $12.5 million on the street for just those technologies that are going to be innovative and game-changing on behalf of the state. So with that um, news, uh, both from the perspective of climate and investment, I am very pleased, if we turn to the next slide, to welcome the members of the Climate Justice Working Group again uh, to our meeting today. It is true that consultation with the Climate Justice Working Group in development of our solar plan is not just required by the law, but it is a critical component of our work to achieve a plan, a scoping plan at the end of the year that will achieve the emission reductions that we need, but to do so in a manner that is centered on the premise of equity. So I think I speak for all members of the council when I say that we are committed to ensuring that the kind of acts emphasis on climate justice is reflected in every step that we take along this path and ultimately reflected within the solving plan itself. So the process has worked so far. Um, we have ensured that the advisory panel, each and every advisory panel have had representation from community-based environmental justice organizations and that in the process, the panel's engaged in meaningful discussion and engagement on these critical topics to receive the perspectives that are needed to achieve these desired outcomes. But now we're in a new phase where the council will obtain input directly from the climate justice working group to inform our mutual development of the solar plan. So at our last meeting, the working group provided us with a climate justice framework to guide our work in the coming months and feedback on the recommendations from the Transportation and Housing and Energy Efficiency uh, Advisory Panels. Today, we are here to hear their perspectives on the Power Generation Advisory Panel recommendations. And they will join us at subsequent meetings um, to provide feedback on other recommendations and as to advance the draft scoping plan. Fundamentally, consultation with this group will ensure that the SOPI plan we issue at the end of the year is established with these principles in mind. So with that, I would like to welcome um, our colleagues from the Climate Justice Working Group. I believe, Jared, you are the first speaker. Jared? Um, excuse me. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry to interrupt. I'm so sorry. Um, I just wanted to point out that it's very difficult to hear the presenters. It comes out very garbled. Um, all right, Thanks, Carla. I will hope that someone here can address that issue because I don't think being close to the microphone will address it. Thank you. Thanks, Carla. Let's start with the presentation. And Carla, let me know if you can hear because those folks will be via WebEx. So maybe that audio will work better while we fix that. I believe uh, I'm starting if we're if we're ready to to begin. Yes, yes. so I'm taking here. 
um, the speaker said. Um, are other people experiencing the same thing I am because uh, they are in and out and quite garbled, so I'm not catching everything. Same here. We may need to mute our microphones if you're not talking. Actually, also, um, it, I don't know if you can hear me, but uh, we can hear those that are on Zoom quite well. Yeah. So we yeah. can hear you quite well. What we, we just can't hear. Anybody Albany. that's making a presentation in the room up at uh, Albany Sierra and Albany. And I don't know, can you hear me now as I speak? Fair. Yes. So, so why don't we start with a presentation from the Climate Justice Worthy Group, which will be via WebEx while we look at the audiovisual circumstances <coughs> in the room. Um, please let me know if we can hear the speakers. One take a, take a moment just to pass to your microphone. Okay, um, so whoever's taking on from the Climate Justice Therapy Group, please go ahead and do so. Let's see how the audience is working. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm kicking it off for everyone. My name is Sonal Jessel. I'm the Director of Policy at We Act for Environmental Justice. We are a community-based organization based in West Harlem since 1988. And um, I think on behalf of the whole working group, we can say thank you for having us here today. We're very um, excited to be able to present our feedback on the Power Generation Advisory Panel to everyone today and I'd also like to start with a small disclaimer that not everyone presenting from the climate justice working group today is necessarily an expert on power generation so if there is ever a question that we're unable to answer live today we will certainly make sure to be getting you feedback um, written in the near future if that if that happens so we can move to the next slide Sorry, and then the next one, <laughs> we'll start on the next one. Thank you. Um, so just to begin our overall impressions of the panel recommendation, we were generally happy with the recommendations with some um, need for improvement in specific areas. So we were very excited about the discussion around workforce development, the consideration, uh, very important consideration of the need for affordability when it comes to power generation, um, the large amount of consideration put into community solar access, the rapid expansion of renewable energy, and the phasing out of existing fossil fuel plants. We all thought those were really exciting points that were presented. Our concerns are around the still open door to false solutions, um, which we will sort of bring up in the different different points throughout the conversation. Um, the need to have a little bit more emphasis on energy democracy, public power, and the consideration that the uh, programs specifically for lower uh, income folks needs to be more highly uh, elevated in, throughout the recommendations. And lastly, cumulative impacts are really important in environmental justice communities where the consideration of co-pollutants um, when we're thinking about our power generation. You can move to the next slide. So I'm presenting on our access and affordability, which is one of the sections in the power generation advisory, um, uh, the panel recommendations. So Overall, um, we think it's important that there to have a huge emphasis on the need for major reform for utility bill assistance, especially if we move towards um, more electricity use. What is that going to do to people's utility costs, uh, especially for lower income individuals? And it needs to especially be said that it's really important that we have um, no energy burden over 6% for anybody in New York State. However, that is not what's happening in actuality. In fact, I saw a recent um, mention of about 1.2 million New Yorkers are energy burdened currently. And a lot of those folks um, that experience energy burden existed pre-pandemic as well. So this has been an existing issue for a long time. Um, so one thing that we want to see done um, is to prioritize the modifications for the New York State Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program um, the way that they structure the program, specifically considering how we're installing technology that is more efficient, 
Um, and that we are ensuring that in the cooling assistance program, we are paying people's utility bills or subsidizing utility bills, which is extremely important considering electricity, um, folks utilities bills spike a lot in the summertime with increased AC use. Um, and then next, we think that New York State agencies need to improve their efforts to collaborate and share programs and resources. So coordination between state agencies is essential, such as OTADA, NYSERDA, DPS, HDR, DEC, DOH. Um, there's uh, an energy efficiency component that we need here and actual financial support to assist low-income individuals and disadvantaged communities. And these agencies need to not work in silos to address these different issues for low-income individuals um, and ensure that they are, the individuals are aware of all of the programs that are offered. Next, that the New York State Department of Public Service should study and consider using alternative rate structures for, as a means of prote protecting low income and disadvantaged communities and households and small businesses as well from large cost shifts. How are we getting a little bit more creative with our rate structure and rate design? Um, it could be a very progressive um, way to support energy efficiency, renewable, and beneficial electrification. The current rate structure doesn't think about it this way. Um, the next piece is that the recommendation focused on 40% of investment mandate is critical for CLCTA. While the advisor panel provided some initial guidance, we think it requires some further input and process from the working group, the climate justice working group, and other key stakeholders. There should be transparency around annual reports and publicly available accounting systems to track the spending and actual benefits, as well as remediation efforts if targets are not um, attained. And additionally, we need development of interagency definition of benefits of public investment. And we, we support efforts to expand existing pre-development programs for energy projects, which are owned and controlled by municipalities, community-based organizations, um, and other appropriate constituencies like HDFCs, um, uh, churches, indigenous tribes, and um, that that benefit disadvantaged communities. So we're in, we're in support of that comment. We thought that was important to say. Um, and that we, we hope that there is uh, an EJ team of some sort that can be uh, put together more within different agencies, like uh, like appointing an environmental justice lead at, at DPS. And then the last thing that is important to um, put out here when it comes to affordability is how we are providing people the pathway for upgrading their appliances. It can be a really burdensome upfront cost, and it's very important that we um, provide incentives for lower income households to, to switch their appliances. I'm handing over to my other working group member for the next slide. Uh, thanks, Sonal. Um, uh, good afternoon, council members. I'm Eddie Bautista with the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance. I'm going to cover the uh, retirement of fossil fuel fired facilities. Um, uh, we're supportive of, of rapidly launching an assessment and planning process to determine emissions reduction targets to reach zero emissions by 2040 uh, so that grid reliability is maintained and adequate uh, CLCPA compliant resources like clean generation, battery storage, demand response, et cetera, can be planned for and implemented as fossil generation resources are retired to reach uh, to achieve the 100% zero emission electric system in 2040. Um, we need a clear process for the promulgation of emissions reductions by DEC with an enforceable end date of 2040 for greenhouse gas emissions in compliance with the CLCPA. Uh, similar to the PICA rule, any closures designated by the emissions re regulations of fossil fuel generation facilities would prompt a reliability needs analysis and identification of alternatives. Um, an iterative planning process, such as a planning docket involving the New York State Planning Board and the Public Service Commission, should build on the assessment which, in which the progress, the reduction targets, the regulations, and other mechanisms being utilized are evalu evaluated and revised as necessary every two years in order to reach the 2040 goal. Um, in terms of a moratorium on fossil fuel power plants, we support a moratorium um, on new fossil generation until uh, final CAC recommendations are adopted 
by the state and, and DEC has completed its assessment and determination of emissions reduction regulations, you know, and setting decreasing emission limits and targets leading um, to zero emission generations by 2040. And the New York State Planning Board and the PSC have finalized the electric sector um, gas planning process, by, um, placing a moratorium on new fossil fuel facilities until those conditions are met will support and ensure the achievement of the emissions reductions targets and compliance with DEC regulations. No new facilities should be permitted under the moratorium unless a system reliability need is certified that demonstrates that reliability need cannot be met in a reasonable time frame by any combination of zero emission resources. Uh, this is imperative to ensure that CLCPA compliant resources are prioritized for new generation needs and new resources are not permitted that are unnecessary for grid lot reliability and incompatible with the CLCPA. Um, just, just a side note about this. I mean, and I think uh, uh, Commissioner Sego touched on it. You know, in a week where we're seeing red moons and yellow skies, um, the fact that we're talking about a moratorium on fossil, it should seem as a no brainer. If we don't, um, this state uh, and, and leadership in this state runs the risk of looking like um, a cliche from a bad disaster movie, right? Like, don't be the mayor in Amity, Long Island that doesn't listen to the sheriff. Close the beaches. This is that, this is that analogy. Um, Going on, we encourage the council to act to address the emissions and potential greenhouse gas emissions of the proliferation of fossil fuel fired facilities for usage in cryptocurrency mining operations as energy intensive Bitcoin mining facilities are taking advantage of a loophole in PSE oversight to repower fossil generating facilities behind the meter uh, and could significantly undermine the emissions reduction goals in the CLCPA. Uh, we should likewise establish a moratorium on the operation of proof of work cryptocurrency mining operations until the conclusion of a full generic environmental impact statement to determine whether such operations can be mitigated to comply with the CLCPA. Um, I'll stop there and turn it over to uh, my colleague, Jared. Next slide, please. Thank you, Eddie, and uh, thank you, council members. Uh, my name is Jared Bly, I'm the Clean Energy Program Director at the Adirondack North Country Association, and I'll be covering uh, four recommendations under the distributed generation and distributed energy resources uh, set of recommendations. So we support and urge the prioritization of the following recommendations. So with respect to compensation, um, address improvements in the uh, the VEDER stack to more accurately reflect value provided by distributed energy resources, incorporating the EC's social cost of carbon calculation in the avoided transmission cost. Uh, also introduce environmental justice and disadvantaged community adder to that value stack. Continuing on target incentives to stimulate high value DER projects like dual use solar and ag or agro, agrivoltaics. Multifamily housing, heat pumps, or geothermal or geo exchange, et cetera, and so on. And pair them with low to moderate income and environmental justice electrification goals. Also expand NYSERDA's solar energy equity framework. Uh, furthermore, create dynamic rate structures and programs that provide appropriate price signals and stimulate um, distributed energy resource usage. And last, ensure a process is in place that assures low to moderate income uh, households and community solar savings don't in any way prevent access to other LMI energy saving programs like the heating assistance program. Thank you. I think it's uh, back to me, Jared. Um, uh, we're moving on to the reliability uh, for the future grid. Thank you. Um, you know, generally, NISO should be more transparent. We we need more checkpoint um, checkpoints and opportunities for public input and critique. For example, the NISO's reliability needs assessment can be better disseminated and shared uh, with local energy advocates. Um, in fact, um, a number of recommendations 
uh, have also been put forward that there needs to be more um, uh, ad energy advocates considered for appointment to the board of NISO. Um, there's a need to sync uh, the CLCPA scoping plan and the CLCPA mandates with to the state energy plan. Um, we support the panel recommendation to improve reliability um, and resilience to climate impacts via continued infrastructure investment. Uh, and, and we you know, obviously say that we need, to, we need to prioritize projects in historically overburdened uh, black and brown communities where obviously access to basic amenities have historically um, uh, been, uh, we, we've not have, had, had equal access to basic amenities. And we need to do this with, the, with design criteria that can be adopted um, to reflect the evolving climate impacts. Um, furthermore, we need to invest in community outreach to provide effective communication and support uh, for communities impacted by extreme weather events. Uh, and, and finally, there's a need to address extreme heat vulnerabilities beyond overcapacity to the grid, such as the increased water demand uh, for cooling of power plant systems, uh, and the expansion of metal and power lines as a result of extreme heat resulting in sagging power lines that leads also to an increase of tree, uh, tree strike related fires. We go on to the, the next slide. So, uh, for technology solutions, um, we're concerned about the promotion of, of false solutions like green hydrogen, renewable natural gas, uh, waste energy, et cetera. Um, in terms of the achievement of 70 by 30, we're supportive of recommendations to prioritize uh, the 70% renewables by 2030 target, as it's critically important that we reach these goals with the technologies that we currently have available. Uh, in terms of achievement of 100 by 40, we're concerned about these efforts and demonstration projects distracting from the clear renewable energy goals. Uh, and, and we wanna highlight the recommendation focused on the need for further research and considerations of life cycle GHG accounting and potential air quality and health impacts of these unproven technologies. Uh, yeah, these industry supported techno fixes uh, promise to reduce emissions despite their question, uh, I'm sorry, Industry supported technology fixes that promise to reduce re uh, emissions despite their questionable legality under CLCPA. Uh, research shows that they often do the opposite and often don't reduce pollution burden. In fact, in some cases, have increased pollution burden in environmental justice communities. Uh, and just to give you um, uh, just some, some additional insights on this, the, you know, um, there was a report that we would urge the uh, Climate Action Council uh, to look at. It was a, a New York Renews False Solutions report that outlined some several, you know, several key problems with these alternative fuel sources. First, they're often carbon intensive. Some of them literally add more greenhouse gases that would be reduced by switching from fossil fuels. Second, many of them could be must be combusted to produce energy leading to more local pollution, which is concentrated in environmental justice communities. Third, some of these fuels are not economically viable to replace even marginal amounts of our energy footprint. Fourth, reliance on bioenergy, um, bioenergy sources diverts land use from food to energy, depletes the Earth's ability to reduce carbon and contributes to water pollution. Uh, finally, some of these alternative fuel sources require intensive water use to produce and can contribute to severe water stress. Um, and just a word about hydrogen. Uh, hydrogen is generating a lot of interest as zero carbon or low carbon fuel. Its ability to be injected into existing natural gas infrastructure has led to several large oil and gas companies promoting its use to preserve their existing pipeline assets while lowering emissions. However, despite all the hype surrounding hydrogen, there are several reasons to be concerned about its use, particularly when combusted in power plants. When hydrogen gas is, is combusted, as in a power plant, it's not emissions free. Uh, when, when, H2, when hydrogen uh, does not generate carbon dioxide when combusted, well, it doesn't, it can lead to increases in nitrogen oxide, emission rates up to six times that of methane. Um, and uh, let me move on to uh, nuclear. Um, recommendations should be strengthened to address the real environmental health, safety and emissions and injustice impacts of nuclear energy and to avoid advantaging nuclear energy over actually clean energy sources. The health, safety, water, air and environmental justice impacts of nuclear energy must be taken seriously and should be subject to the same life cycle analysis as fossil fuels. 
the state needs to proactively plan for the scheduled shutdowns of the four nuclear power reactors in upstate New York. The next two retirements are scheduled for 2029 and will happen unless the state is willing to shell out multiple billions more in nuclear subsidies. It will be much more cost effective to proactively replace the reactor's generation with energy efficiency and renewable electricity. Planning also needs to include transition funds for workers and communities. It's imperative that the state not wait until the last minute to attend to this replacement. This planning should begin immediately. The inflexibility of nuclear power generation may increasingly conflict with the needs of the electricity system as more and more variable renewable energy generation is added. This issue should be analyzed now so as to clear a pathway for more renewable energy in the system. Any nuclear subsidies beyond the current subsidies, which expire in 2029, should be used as an absolute last resort after all alternatives have been thoroughly explored and assessed and should be temporary. The Onondaga Nation must be consulted and listened to about the nuclear power plants and nuclear waste located on their traditional lands and about nuclear waste transported through their territory. Again, this should be happening now. Um, I'll turn it over to, uh, I think, Sono, you're taking on workforce development? Yes, thank you. So we can go to the next slide. Um, just a short piece on workforce development. We were supportive of a lot of the recommendations it, that the advisory panel put together around providing education, career opportunities, and clean energy, um, particularly for the disadvantaged communities and for employees in, in the fossil fuel industry currently. Um, we believe that the that disadvantaged communities, worker, current workers, MWBE folks need state agencies involved in large, small scale clean energy projects to leverage their capacity and lock in enforceable commitments or on access to quality jobs and ensure public investments in workforce development generate the desired return on investment. Um, that um, we think it's important to leverage tools like community workforce agreements, community benefits agreements, um, first source hiring, project labor agreements should be used all to increase access to construction and permanent jobs for members of the defined disadvantaged communities and to ensure accountability um, to local and targeted hiring goals. Agreements should be developed in partnership with those frontline communities, industry, as well as organized labor. And one thing that we believe is really important is um, the need to emphasize cooperatives and worker owned worker owned cooperatives to be hired for um, all projects, private and public, and that the that um, it's promoting not only a growth of uh, low income people, people of color in the workforce, but it's promoting ownership in that workforce, um, which is a huge difference um, when we're trying to move towards principles such as such as energy democracy. Um, and so I think I'm going to hand over to Jared for the next next slide. So overall the the group supported this series of recommendations under energy delivery and, and hosting capacity, but we do have a couple actions that we'd like to see added. Um, first, proactively identify key transmission and distribution upgrades, improvements, and new line construction needed to deliver renewable energy across the state and to maximize the retirement of fossil fuel fired resources. Approach interconnection with an intelligent, justice oriented lens. So, um, to add to that, adopt, <clears throat> excuse me, adopt PSC regulations to allow for advanced metering to enable cost effective and time efficient solar interconnection options. Work with community based organizations to tailor regulatory changes in favor of community led clean energy projects and ensure that they are sufficiently resourced to engage in that process. Subsidize community led solar projects for customer side upgrades and equipment and exempt them from all utility side interconnection costs. Consider sub, uh, subsidizing offshore wind interconnection upgrades as placing the cost burden entirely on the industry may lead to the uh, CLCPA mandated deployment targets. It may delay those targets. And study grid vulnerabilities in disadvantaged communities and prioritize improvements in those areas. 
I think it's, is it back to you, Sonal? Yes, it is. <laughs> Thank you, Jared. So we can go to the next slide, please. So around the growth of large scale renewable energy generation piece, um, we didn't have too much here. Um, we're generally supportive of creating and accelerating deployment of renewable energy systems, solar, uh, land-based wind, offshore wind, um, also in alignment with the clean energy standard. Um, we do want to add this caveat that it's always important that we're balancing large scale renewable with significant investment in um, support for DACs to develop behind the meter microgrids to reduce grid strain, increase resiliency and affordability and diversify the state's energy portfolio. Um, and then in terms of community acceptance, it's really important for public education and outreach to occur. Um, New York State um, needs a, a statewide public education campaign to inform New Yorkers about the climate crisis and the benefits of shifting to a clean energy economy. It's really important that people know what that means and what impact that has on their, their home, their energy use. Um, and uh, we need to ensure that community benefits in general are tracked <laughs> in dollars and um, also that we're not forgetting to track the avoided health care costs um, as well when we're thinking about about um, impacts when it when it comes to these programs. So you can move to the um, next, oh, the, the other piece here is, is around incentivizing uh, climate resiliency hubs and local um, resiliency work, um, which is really important for community that there's central locations for solar um, and storage. And it's a place where people can gather when there's an extreme weather event, which we know happens a lot. And we just mentioned at the big commissioner mentioned at the beginning, it's happening very frequently. We've seen a lot happen this year. Um, we do need spaces for community to go um, in emergency situations. So we need a lot more um, resiliency hubs to be expanded here. So you can move to the next slide now. Um, Around the existing storage technology, we do support the state's updated energy storage roadmap. Energy storage is extremely important, um, and we ex we support it being updated as soon as uh, practicable to um, update and revise storage deployment goals, recognizing the higher requirements identified in the power grid study of 15 gigawatts by 2030. Um, we support the recommendation to provide increased funding for energy storage development and deployment. We support the recommendation to init initiate a new docket, ideally before uh, the end of 2021, that establishes new mandated yearly energy storage targets, increasing to an overall statewide storage target of 15 gigawatts by 2030, and creates mandated funding and financing mechanisms similar to the clean energy standard for storage. And I believe I'm sending it to um, Eddie for gas. Sorry, next slide. We'll know for sure. Yes. Was that me? Sorry, that is yep, that is mine. Um is gas infrastructure transmission and methane leakage. The transition away from gas infrastructure is a strong recommendation that was articulated by the power generation panel. So it should include a detailed analysis on the cost effective and equitable strategy necessary for this transition to be just. The recommended proceeding on GHD reductions for gas utilities concerning transmission and allocation of timelines should prioritize progress in areas and EJ communities where co pollutants pose a high cumulative burden. We recommend scrutinize the legitimacy of of the concern that phasing out gas infrastructure poses grid reliability risks as the notion unnecessarily conflicts with achieving crucial short-term foundational emission reductions. Continuing to build out infrastructure on the premise of degraded reliability is concerning and needs further consideration. It's not necessary and becomes a stranded asset. We must ask who pays for this and who will truly benefit from it. Clarify what the recommendation on supporting DEC efforts mean means if this refers to existing processes. Um, 
that should be explicit and expressed as a recommendation. It's unclear at this point. The abandoned wells approach should be more thoughtful. This includes public funds should be used as a last resort to cap wells as it drains resources from investments that could be made in transitioning disadvantaged communities to clean energy. And last, consider ways for, for the oil and gas industry um, can adopt a well in their service territory or otherwise contribute to reducing emissions from sources. I believe that is the last slide of the group. So we'll turn it back over. Perfect. <laughs> anyone? How about anyone on the webinar? Any other ways to know? I believe we're done. Oh, no. All right. Yes, we can hear you. Yes, we can hear you. All right, we're going to assume people get here. We're going with that. Um, let me start um, to see. I, I know that the flashcards are taped down, um, so <laughs> lifting them might have been a request that was feasible. But if you have a question, um, why don't you uh, just raise your hand and uh, turn your mic up here in Albany, and then we'll, we'll go to New York City. <laughs> Um, can you guys hear me? Um, I just wanted to add or maybe ask if um confirm whether we I think it was sent on March 8th by um Susie Seven Spaces had an alternate viewpoint on the policy of the shoot report, so I just wanted to confirm that it's part of the Planning Action Council's record. So really great writer that you just have a different perspective that they wanted to offer. Um, and uh, you know, a lot of scientists from uh New York City and all over the country had some viewpoints. So it's not make sure that's part of our overall practice to talk about all solutions um which I can forward that um, to Sarah and the co chairs. I told you. I believe we do have. So, my question was just uh, I was trying to confirm whether the uh, CAC had its current record of our shape by the sense. Um, they had another perspective on the false submissions report, and I think Sarah has confirmed that we uh, do have it. So, um, that, that was really uh, what I wanted to just throw out. So thank you. Uh, folks, I, I just got to say uh, from our end, you guys sound like a 1986 a train announcement. We're hearing like every other <laughs> word. I'm not hearing anything. So apologies. We're not trying to be rude, but it's like not stop. Or, 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 that's, what, that's what we're hearing. So sorry. Where is the one? Everyone, one moment, please. Where is the audio input into the webinar? Lab it's into the it's into there from this room into that. Okay. Um, hang on a sec. Our speaker right next to that. New York City, can you hear me better now? Yes. Oh uh, no. Okay. Something happened. Anything. We hear anything. Yeah. Right. How do we get those speakers over to that? Yeah, I have to put that in there. Someone else did too. All right, we're facing this. Hang on. You want to go? Yeah. Seriously? Yeah. <laughs> 
speak into the speak into the <laughs> yeah. laptop. Is that one? Um, sorry, I hope you don't see me in close up, but um, you no, know, I really just had a comment that I was trying to affirm that uh, the Climate Action Council had received a letter from uh, 57 uh, scientists that had another viewpoint on the false solutions report and they uh, I wanted to just uh, affirm that it was part of the record for the Climate Action Council and that you all have it because it's another perspective um, and I think it's worth all of us being aware of. So that was that was my comment and question. And uh, Sarah has affirmed that they do have it. Um, and maybe we can just make sure everyone on the Climate Action Council has also received it. So thank you for your comments. Um, really appreciate it. Yeah. We're working on it. That, that was good. All right, here we go. <laughs> Does anyone else have questions for the 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 speakers. If you do, I think coming up here would be a great idea. All right. Can you, everyone can hear me while I stand here? Yeah. Hello, this is John Howard. If you haven't been here, uh, a couple of questions. Um, first of all, I do appreciate your comments on the need for equitable funding for all our renewable projects, particularly as we integrate them, and that the inequitable allocation of those costs will slow us down in, in no doubt. And there's a question regarding prevailing wages. Do you believe that they should be extended to all new uh, state uh, subsidized generation projects, including small solar and DER projects? I, I don't think that the climate justice working group uh, as an entity has been asked that and, and, and whether we can we certainly can't give you a consensus position on that because we this is the first time this question has been asked of us. Uh, I can tell you that some of us believe the prevailing wage is just a basic labor um, accommodation that um, you know should be should be honored everywhere and every anywhere. Uh, but that that is that would be personal um, uh, or maybe some of our institutional positions. But the climate justice work you uh, hasn't had a position because we haven't been asked this question. Okay, and. Uh... Oh, hello. And then a question of cost allocation for transmission related to offshore wind integration. How, do you have an opinion on how that should be handled? I don't know if any of my uh, fellow uh, working group members have anything to say. Could you be a little more specific in terms of what? Well, currently uh, the plan is to have it uh, shared by a percentage of load that uh, will be served by the by the offshore wind uh, projects for instance currently it's a, i believe it's a 75 25 for downstate and uh, 25 75 upstate uh, as you can probably guess i've received a lot of comments from both upstate and downstate interests on that issue so i wonder if you had an opinion on how those allocations should be done I personally would need to know a little bit more about the. Uh, it, it, I, I I tend not to try to make knee jerk responses to technical uh, and and naughty questions, but I don't know if any of the other working group members uh, has any insights. I think that's that's a similar answer to what Eddie said to your first question that we don't have a consensus on that question because we haven't been asked it before. But I'm writing this down, and what we can do as a working group is talk about it and see if we do have a consensus answer for you. Well, I'd, I'd love to hear what uh, you may come up with. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anyone else here in Albany have questions? Dennis? Um, while you guys are maybe thinking of another question, I, I did have one, I think, again, I was, um, we, we were, we had, uh, no pun intended, disadvantaged position because we couldn't quite hear the question. Uh, I guess my question for um, uh, the sister who mentioned uh, the letter from the scientists with a different position. Um, it, does any can anyone um, can anyone clarify whether any of these scientists work for research institutions that receive money from the fossil fuel industry? If not, I would urge the Climate Action Council to look further into that just to see if you're going to be getting opinions. It'd be great to know if they are unbiased, objective, or potentially whether this represents a conflict of professional interest. 
Uh, yeah, Eddie, um, Donna had indicated that the letter had been signed by whomever had supported the work, which I, th I think Sarah, you're confirming this letter is, is I, available I and we can circulate it for your review. No, I, I don't question the names. I question what we know who's funding these scientists. And I don't, and I imagine the letter doesn't say that. So I'm just saying, let's, if we're going to look at this, let's look a little more deeply and not just letters that yeah. come in from institutions yeah. without any clarity about what may be behind some of these positions. Okay. Thanks, Eddie. Good point. Dennis. Okay. Hi, Dennis Elson back. Um, it was hard to follow your 8 point font uh, from 20 feet away. So I, 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 but what I was getting confused on, quite honestly, is almost the interchangeability of the use, use of transmission and distribution as you're going through your assessment. And you've really got to clarify the difference between the two. They are two separate systems. Uh, you had mentioned uh, that you'd like to see compensation around DERs for avoided uh, transmission costs. I, I do understand that. Utilities do non-wires alternatives. I'm wondering if you reviewed those to see whether or not they are maybe not adequate. They're not hitting what you would uh, feel that they need to hit a little bit uh, stronger because I, I thought that was a, that was a good point. Um, but I would also uh, ask, uh, don't you consider maybe con compensation on DERs for avoided uh, additional supply, regardless of what that supply is, or for shutting down peakers? So that, that was kind of like of interest to me. Uh, have you considered that? Could you repeat that last line? I'm sorry, you, it, it, uh, you, we lost you right before peakers, which peaked our interest. But so repeat that. So, yeah, so uh, what you're mentioning is uh, compensation for distributed energy resources to avoid transmission costs, which the utilities are currently doing in some form or fashion. Did you review those non wires alternatives to see whether or not they're adequate or did you have additional ideas as to how to maximize those? And did you consider the compensation of DERs, not just to avoid transmission costs, but to avoid additional uh, supply or in shutting down uh, the peaker plants? I, I, I would defer to my uh, fellow working group members. I, I, would, I, would, I would actually suggest that that's a question that should have been asked to the power generation panel, because we are, re we are reacting to their recommendations. But um, yeah, I'm interested if any of the working group members have any uh, insights they'd like to share. Let me just expand as to why I'm asking, because your initial uh, sessions uh, under your uh, presentations, I think, and this was sent to me by, by reminder by my friend Sarah, so I appreciated that. And this was uh, something presented on May 12th. And you talked about identified uh, investments to benefit disadvantage, and this is now predominantly on the distribution side or the demand side of the electric system. And you talk a lot about clean green schools, uh, beneficial electrification, solar for all, uh, community solar, and then you mentioned also uh, community power. Uh, and then I also read further in your document that said infrastructure is not part of the 40% spend. Um, if we look at all of the recommendations that, that you're kind of like looking at in terms of how to benefit, uh, part of balancing the system is understanding that the infrastructure in place cannot perform what you just asked or what you're focused on providing be simply because the capacity of the distribution system is not supportive of that. And community power, if we move it closer, whether it's solar or any other source, it consumes that same level of capacity that we do not have. So I'm just wondering, you know, you know, why can't we look at the potential of infrastructure being part of the 40% spend uh, simply because in order to perform some of these decarbonization options, uh, we need infrastructure. So it's not, it's not something that is uh, separate. 
I, I think I'm a little confused because DER is also infrastructure, is it not? Uh, DER, well, let's say definition of DER is more of a component, uh, whereas infrastructure I look at is an actual distribution or transmission feeder. Yeah, I, I think I think we we may be. I, I feel like we may be talking a little past each other because all of, I don't. It's hard for me to imagine any form of DER not being infrastructure. But I think the point of the forty percent and therefore this this infrastructure question is the forty percent was was intended for community benefit, direct community benefit, and and taking the forty percent and applying it for infrastructure or taking pieces of forty percent. When you have the remaining 60%, it worries me because there's such a fix. There's there appears to be a fixation on the 40% for the frontline communities. And everyone ignores there's another 60% of clean energy funding that's available for it sounds like what you're talking about. So I, I, I'm, maybe I'm misunderstanding. And let me let me be quiet and see if anybody else uh, from the working group has a, a, a better or different uh, take on this question. Just I, it, it's just, I'm trying to be, you know. Uh, to indicate that we can't kind of like look at uh, electrification without understanding in order to get to electrification, we need to invest in infrastructure. They're not separate line items. So what we assume is, is that the infrastructure or the distribution system will fall onto uh, the utilities through rate filing. And, and these are our costs to achieve. And I don't want to lose sight of the fact that just because we've electrified that we've solved something and that we've contributed to the 40%, but yet we're still looking at needing to invest in distribution systems. The transmission system is an example of that. We, we've got a number of renewable energy projects in the queue and when the utilities looked at in totality, they discovered that they need to put an additional 17 and a half billion dollars into their transmission system. All I'm trying to say is don't th this is, supply, demand and delivery needs to be in balance. You, we can't be talking about one without understanding that there's an impact on another. That's all. Thanks, Dennis. Anyone else here in Albany have questions or points they would want to make? How about New York City? Any questions? Nope. Try again, Ryan. <laughs> it sounded like next stop is 96. Shoot. That's all I heard. <laughs> Feel like Step to the front of the phone. Can, can folks hear me? Can folks hear me? Yep. Yes. Right. I just wanted to say thank you so much. I think we got another really thoughtful, common sense, meaningful presentation from the climate justice working group. And so I have, I do have a, well, if not a, I think two two comments to make. One, I wanted to um, also comment on this issue that um, Dennis and Eddie were just talking about. And I think that we do need to make a very careful examination of the uh, equitable <laughs> development of infrastructure um, on both the distribution, um, including the distribution system uh, in the context of the 40% of um, and the 60% that Eddie's talking about. I think that's a, you know, I know that the, the, uh, the definition, you know, disadvantaged communities criteria are supposed to emerge soon, but I just want to emphasize that that is absolutely a critical investigation in terms of what benefit looks like. And then as we work to build out the infrastructure, both transmission and the distribution side, that's happening in an equitable manner. And that may or may not dovetail with the, um, uh, with the sort of 40%. And so I want to ask how you know what this is not to the climate justice working group but perhaps to basil and doreen what mechanism will we have to make sure that we do that and that was my second comment was also i see integration analysis up here but my second question is again we've got a fantastic set of recommendations from the climate justice working group how are we going to see these recommendations and others built into the integration analysis 
Yeah, thanks, Raya. In fact, I know, um, well, first, sorry, the, the, the second question actually, one, one point I know Sarah was going to plan to make and, and sort of reflecting on the integration analysis and our next steps was to answer some of these questions about how this all sort of comes together. So if it's okay, let's make sure, Sarah, you, you, you integrate that into your discussion. Um, does anyone have feedback on, on other parts though of Raya's questions, specifically from the Climate Justice Working Group in the first instance? Uh, this is Rawa. I just had a quick question on process. Um, so one of the process questions is there were some really good questions that were, were asked that we did not have um, consensus on. So we would like to know how to get that um, response back to the CAC. Um, and then secondarily, I think the process of just like you guys asked us questions and we are take, we're going to take some time and respond back to you. We've asked a lot of questions of the CAC, and so we would just love um, that mutuality so that we are clear about how the comments that we are making are also being integrated either into your thought process or if you just had a direct response and some additional questions for us, you know, so that it's a back and forth thing that's happening. Sure, yeah, well, in the event that you have additional thoughts or answers to questions down the road. I know there is an opportunity. This isn't the last time we'll be we'll we'll be meeting with you. I would say there's no harm in sort of going back to topics that we had covered previously. Um, if that's helpful, certainly I know that we always don't have answers to every question that's asked of us either. Um, so that that's an open invitation. With respect to the second topic, I really do think it speaks to kind of this what's next question. So maybe we can can talk that through in the context of, of some thoughts Sarah has prepared, if that's okay. Um, are there other questions from my org? Sorry. Sorry, we've got a sorry for the funny angles happening here in New York. I for my question about um, equity and energy justice and the and the district, you know, and the transmission the distribution system, perhaps do we have the um our public service commission chair? Perhaps uh he could uh, address this question in terms of where this analysis will fit in. May or may not. Pardon me, can you just say that one more time? Can you just say that one more time for me, please? Well, we just had a discussion about sort of equity um, benefit um, on the really on the on both the transmission and distribution systems and, and how we can make sure that as we build the capacity that we need for electrification and, and local renewables and large scale renewables that we're getting. Um, equity and also benefit to disadvantaged communities and, and others. And that is, uh, you know, that, that is within the mandate of the Climate Justice Working Group and the Power Generation Panel, but it doesn't seem to have been addressed specifically. And so I'm wondering where do you think the best pathway to really analyze that piece lies? You just emphasize the, uh, the issues uh, behind equitable rate making writ large. For the last 150 years, so the issue becomes. Yeah, yes, I, I, I that's why we asked you because I know this is a this is a. Uh, well, you know, as you know, as you know uh, we are involved in our low income proceeding, which, uh, which we will hope to uh, conclude relatively soon in the next month or two. Again, that will be an ongoing proceeding because these issues become more acute as we add more cost to the system. <laughs> All of these terrific new technologies that we hope and pray for are not free. As a matter of fact, they are enormously expensive. Just to yes. put it in context, we are planning to rebuild our entire electric generation system in under a generation that's never been done before. And actually, we don't even know how much it's going to cost. Exactly. So getting a handle on the bro overall cost, then we can talk about how we allocate those costs across current rate uh, rate payers. And I've said repeatedly many times, both in this context and others, that funding the entire rebuilding of the grid and associated uh, 
generation and transmission assets solely on bills will be nearly impossible. We will need other sources of funding. And I was gratified to hear that Commissioner Segos uh, made reference to our the Biden administration and their new goals. The goals are terrific. We have great goals. We have mandates. So we must spend the money. So I really hope that as the Congress in particular moves forward, this would be the most immediate near-term source of funding for these large renewable and transmission projects will be the federal treasury. Uh, if that does not uh, present itself, then we have a much more difficult uh, uh, problem in allocating cost across rate payers. Because at some point, the bills must be paid. And uh, you know, acutely aware of the impact of current bills on low-income customers and the adequacy or inadequacy of what we do now, but as we add enormous costs, that uh, that problem only gets worse. So the short answer is we are working very diligently on our low, current low-income program that will have to have a dyna dynamism to it that will move forward as we add additional cost to the system. How we allocate those uh, equitably uh, and equitably, and then also my other concern on the same thing is not only on the low income side, but our general economic competitiveness. Not all states are going to go at this pace that we are. And if while our investments will be very positive to the economy writ large, there will be portions of the economy, as you guys acknowledge, that will be suffering. For instance, if you close the nuclear plants and you want to compensate the communities and the workers, uh, that will cost some money. We'll need to identify how we do that. Uh, but other large uh, industrial processes that, that, you know, that many communities are very dependent upon uh, will need to be in considering too. So I hope that answers sort of your question. The question is, it's a long process without a good answer currently. By the no, way, a funny just one thought, just one follow up, Betty, and then I, 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 that's very helpful, and I thank you for that. And I just want to, I guess, confirm that there within that there's the understanding that there is this mandate for, you know, for forty percent and for equity and affordability throughout through the CLCPA, and that the Public Service Commission, you know, within these considerations you're talking about, understands that that needs to be applied as well, and that could that could include rate cases as well. Um, can I jump in? Oh, well, I just I want to hear the answer from the chair, please. Well, I'm acutely aware of the of the mandate. So uh, the, what I'm just telling you that we do not have the complete roadmap of how we're going to get there and it fulfills the mandate and provides a complete equitable solution across all ratepayers. Well, sir, that is what this process indeed is about. So if there, if if, if please tell us how we can help you get there if we are not there. If that's not the road that we're on. Well, again, uh, like all folks, and I had this discussion yesterday with folks in Westchester regarding issues uh, dealing with reliability about, uh, it was mostly about storm reliability and storm restoration. But people need to be engaged in the process. I know these yes. are painfully difficult processes, our PSG rate cases and associated policy cases. But that is the form that we use to make our decisions that we provide to the commission. So the more that you can uh, participate in those processes, the better it will be for, for everybody. And uh, I know it's difficult and uh, on a personal note, I will stand ready to make any effort we can to make it easier for you to participate, you writ large, participate in these very difficult cases that often have tens of thousands of pages in, in the record. Uh, and very, so to that extent, so we're happy to, uh, See how we can make it work better. All right, certainly supportive of intervener compensation and ways to to help folks participate in these processes. But please, we we need to be working on this exact pathway right now. So please continue to let us know how we can help do that. And I'm certainly here to to help with that. But by, by, by the way, um, 
If, if it, can, can you guys hear me? I just want to make sure I wasn't yeah. stepping on anyone's. Oh, okay. Um, funny you should ask about how to pay for it. We, in fact, have been pushing for something called the Climate and Community Investment Act, a polluter fee that would raise on the order of $15 billion a year. So, yeah, there are ways of paying for it, and it would be helpful if we could get our partners in government to sit down and actually look at the CCIA that was introduced in both houses last session, and we have a budget coming up. That's a perfect opportunity to see where the CCIA could add value in our upcoming budget conversation. So, yeah, how to pay for it? We actually are helping to point us in the right direction, meaning past the CCIA. Thank you. Um, anyone else in New York City have questions? Hey, just one from, from me and in, in my role at NYSERDA, I'd like to just understand how we think about the world of innovation. And, and, you know, I know your presentation referenced technologies that are viewed as sort of la you call them last resort technologies, meaning only if you absolutely needed them to decarbonize, would you consider them? But the challenge that we have in the world of innovation is that we can't wait for the need to occur. We have to be ready and prepared many, many years beforehand to commercialize, reduce costs, and ultimately implement new technologies. So can you speak a little to how you think about this um, in the context of the framework that you just built? How does How should an entity, at least in your view, consider the world of innovation and new technologies um, in that light, I, I, let me just touch briefly because I don't want to keep uh, dominating here. But you know, the I think that um, we're not we're not luddites, right? Like we understand that. Um, uh, I mean, in fact, I think part of the problem is that we have existing technology right now that we're not figuring out as a state how to maximize, and we're going for the R and D sweet treat of you know green hydrogen and some of these other uh, potential technologies and why are we not looking at how to maximize battery storage and what like there, there there are technologies we have right now that it felt to us that the power generation panel was more focused on 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 again on tech fixes and we get it we know there are billions of dollars coming potentially through reconciliation to to fund you know r and d for this stuff but it, it it just it boggles the mind to us why aren't we looking at what we have right now and figuring out how to mobilize and maximize state resources to massively expand uh, what we already have in terms of clean energy technology, as opposed to stuff uh, that, that that feels like it needs a, they need a lot more. Um, again, public money to to try to figure out. But I'm curious to hear what others uh, how others respond to this. Um, this is Rawa. I think that is a, a really great question, and I think. It, it's, it's complicated and has many answers, but I think another way that we also need to be looking at innovation is that actually there's a lot of innovation and thinking holistically happening in many frontline and fence line communities across the state and across the nation. Um, some of the ways that, you know, we think about innovation is we understand that everything is already interconnected. And the way our systems are currently designed, everything is very much siloed. So even when we talk about the funding question, um, there are many more resources, but are we maximizing and streamlining resources and um, allowing them to be um, uh, deployed in different ways? Uh, so I think there's some really good innovation happening there. Uh, and then speaking to what Eddie said, you know, we haven't really talked enough about uh, this idea of community ownership and community control of resources, including innovative things that already exist, like having microgrids. And so when you think about our current outdated grid and how it's functioning with these extreme weather disruptions that are now becoming completely unpredictable, uh, what we need to do is have centralized, um, you know, sort of bodies, but also decentralizing and redistributing how we think about power generation and distribution. So I just want to say that, um, you know, a lot of the things that Eddie says are 100% right in that we don't have the kind of time. I mean, we are experiencing weather disruptions that we thought were a decade or two away. We are already hitting the tipping points. So we don't really have much time to begin to address the climate crisis because it's here. And so how can we just focus on making the current um, technologies 
that get us off of fossil fuels and really just investing in that and making sure that we are deploying them um, properly. I think another thing, and I would love for Basil to, you know, maybe talk to his colleagues is he was just in Buffalo. And I think what we tried to show are very different innovative ways that are actually incredibly cost effective to um, help address uh, building resiliency and adaptation at the local level. It's gotta be hyper local. Thank you. Thanks, Rawat. Um, it is true. I, I see innovation from multiple perspectives. That's that's a fair and broad way to, to think about it. Thank you both um, for, for answering my question and for all of you for preparing such a comprehensive point of view in response to a very complicated topic. Um, certainly more to come um, from the climate justice working group as described as we as we um, move through the rest of the year. Um, however, at the moment, we're going to pivot to oh, before the you pivot, Sorry, one, one last, I, I don't know if this has been passed along to the Climate Action Council. Climate Justice Working Group uh, has asked, and we really hope you guys take this, you know, in the spirit that it's meant. It has been challenging all summer to try to figure out not just the ongoing responsibilities of the Climate Justice Working Group, but all, you know, the, the definition of disadvantaged communities, the investment, but to try to also give you guys our feedback on all the recommendations uh, and not knowing exactly when the Climate Action Council is meeting, it would be really helpful to us if the council could uh, make a commitment to pub to give us give the public and especially or including us a sense of when you all are meeting between now and the end of the year. Like we have like the climate just working has worked throughout the summer and we've got multiple meetings, including next week. Uh, in order for us to do our job better in terms of advising you all, we need to know what our opportunities to give you feedback are for the rest of the year. Because first we thought we only had one more opportunity in September. Now we're told maybe in August. Maybe it, it, it's really it, it's it's unfair to us if you guys can't fix your schedule between now and the end of the year and allow us to be able to uh, uh, give you guys feedback. Uh, in a way that's thoughtful and, and effective. So I'll just stop there. Yeah, Eddie, I'll take that. Um, absolutely committed to giving you guys a schedule for the year, at least a ballpark schedule, so you know when generally when things could be coming subject to various tweaks. So we will do that. Uh, to Rawa's point, I did have a chance to go and walk through uh, Buffalo, the Push Buffalo, see some of the work that they're doing. And if you didn't know that they were there doing this work, if you just drove through the community, you wouldn't have been impacted by it. But if you get out of the car, walk around, walk with Rawa, see what Push Buffalo has done at the local level to impact so many properties, taking so many risks locally, buying land, looking for uh, strategic opportunities to take in heat pumps, uh, geothermal, solar, community gardens, rain control, rainwater. It is a stunning operation. and. I wish that we could measure, perhaps Rawa could do it, measure the, the benefit to Buffalo of the work that they've done in this 50 plus block radius. I guarantee it's really significant. We can all learn from it. I know that they have strategic partnerships with WE Act and, and elsewhere around the state. Uh, for us, being constrained and moving around the state over the last year, one of the victims of that is not being able to see some of these things firsthand. So. However, we do it, whether it's as a CAC in this crazy schedule we have, or if it's individually as we travel the state, please go see what Push Buffalo has done because they're doing something just like Uprose is doing something down on the South Brooklyn waterfront. It's a new development that you were at, Doreen, uh, where offshore wind is now coming in and being a part of the solution for not just the communities, but also our energy future. So please do that. Um, unless there's anything else, um, they said hitting our targets was going to be difficult. Who knew they meant DEC's audio visual? <laughs> okay, uh, it's fine. We'll get through this together. We're going to take a few minutes to sort this out. We got the team working hard on the solution. Please do not hang up. Don't go anywhere. Just mute, go off screen, whatever. Come back at uh, 335. We will push out instructions if there's something more you should do on your end. Uh, or if there's something more we should do in here, we're going to get this thing sorted out in a few minutes. That's the challenge. Okay. Thank you.
Um, we're, we, I think we're using so, both. So yeah. All right. Okay. And the computer for the WebEx. And your. All right. Um, it looks like. It looks like we're back. Can folks confirm that they can hear me in Albany? Here. Oh, yeah. Can you hear me here? Yeah. I, can you hear me in the back? But it's not. Can folks hear me now? All right. Can folks in New York City hear me? Yep, New York City can hear you. Can folks on the WebEx hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Yes, we can hear you. Yes, Good. you can hear. Okay, great. Um, sorry about that. Um, no, that's not me. We'll now get into the integration analysis um, and Carl Moss will be uh, providing most of that presentation. But before we uh, jump right in, I wanted to provide a little bit of context. If we could go to the next slide, please. Um, so although the integration analysis is designed to provide support for the scoping plan, it's not synonymous with the scoping plan as a whole. It's designed to assess the greenhouse gas reductions, the benefits and the cost of the portfolios of measures statewide. So the implications of various policy recommendations can be understood. So the integration analysis will be a, a very important tool for the members to consider as we develop the scoping plan. Um, but it's not going to be the um, it's not synonymous with with the scoping plan. The scoping plan will be a strategy document that provides the basis uh, to act on the policy recommendations and every policy that uh, advances from the scoping plan will also go through its uh, required regulatory process. Carl's going to walk you through uh, the approach and the initial results of the integration analysis. And I would say this is really meant to be um, something of an informational item. We want to, we certainly want to make sure you understand it. But at the end, towards the end of the presentation, that's where uh, we'll discuss the process of scenario development for the integration analysis. And this is an area in particular that we would like your input on. Um, and and we'll get to that a little bit more. Uh, the um, the scenarios will be used to evaluate the various policy levers. And so that'll be a very important um, aspect of the integration analysis and to inform the scoping plan. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Carl. Okay, sound check. Um, luckily, I've never been told that I'm too quiet. So hopefully this will work. Um, if whoever's running the WebEx, if you could switch the view to maximize the slides, um, so they're a little easier to see for folks in the room. Thank you. Perfect. Um, so I think if we survive the pandemic, we can survive this. Um, so the integration analysis, next slide, please. Um, this is the overall plan for the rest of the afternoon. I'm going to remind folks about the process. Um, I was, it was a pleasure to join you all in January. Um, and we talked about a bit of the plan, which we're now executing on. And I'll remind you all a bit of what kind of where and how we're doing the analysis. Um, I think we've got a view of someone pulling up. Thank you. Um, then what I want to do is actually take a step back and dig into some of the details. So this is going to be a little bit dense in terms of kind of walking through methods and approaches. I think we've um, some of you have been asking for it. And so I, I hope I can bring forward some of the facts of, of what is going to be the basis of our work. Um, what I want to walk you through in more of a uh, stepwise fashion is last June, we gave a, a presentation with some early views on where, um, how we think our targets could, could be met. Since then, we've actually now incorporated all of the provisions within our CLCPA, and I want to walk you through how that affects our current emissions. Um, I then want to spend some time talking about what we call our reference case, and that's really our starting point. It's what do we think our economic activity is going to do going into the future of business as usual? What do we think our existing policies are, 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 are going to get us? 
And that's really forms our uh, basis for how we then compare scenarios. We've then what we've done what we call a test run. Um, so we've taken all the advisory panel recommendations and put them together into one integrated analysis, and we're giving you a first look at what that is. Um, and then what I hope that tees up is a, a, a robust conversation around how we want to build scenarios. And really, the, the, the objective of our work is not to create one view of the future. This is 30 years and we can't predict it perfectly. We want to be able to do is predict where we think we are going to see uncertainties and where you as the council members may want to prioritize different actions into the future. Um, and I, again, I want to reiterate, this is our first conversation, right? So we're going to have several conversations going into the fall. Um, and we'll be able to digest this work over the next few weeks and then get back together and and and, and we can talk again. Um, so with that, can we go to the next slide? Um, so you've seen this slide previously, but in a slightly different form. Um, this is just a, a, a reminder of the process. And so while our primary analytic platform is the E3 Pathways tool, and we do have Tori, who spoke with you all previously, she's on the call for any uh, deeper dives that we want to take. We are building from the work of all the advisory panels. We're building from the recommendations that we're hearing from the working groups and also from ongoing studies. And so we have both detailed transportation and buildings roadmaps that have been ongoing this year. Those analytic tools and those teams were working with the advisory panels. And what we've done for the integration analysis is pull forward that work and pull it together into an economy wide look. We've also done detailed look into the power sector through our previous power grid study. And we've done some deep dives into HFCs and where they're coming from and where they might go. Uh, we've also been looking, working with uh, DEC and others at what are the sources of different waste emissions. Um, and then we've rounded it out by looking at the other um, smaller but important in industrial energy processes um, and uh, and some of the other co-pollutants that are, are that are round out the pie chart. Um, so really it's it's a comprehensive look that isn't just about a single tool, but it's leveraging the input of the many stakeholder groups that have met over these nine months and several different analytic exercises that are going on and are finishing up now. Uh, next slide, please. So what is what's the current High level snapshot of our emissions. Um, again, we fully now calibrated to our CLCPA counting. And what I want to provide is a breakdown and walk you through what are some of the implications of this, this, uh, uh, our new accounting framework. Um, and so again, this, th this new work is based on the draft methodology that that DEC published earlier and is consistent with with the requirements of the CLCPA. Um, and so not surprising buildings and, and, and transportation are still our largest sources of emissions. Buildings have actually grown more. And so they're nearly co-equal with our transportation emissions. And I'll explain a little bit why. We've also seen that our waste sector has grown significantly um, and it's now co-equal with the power sector. So all four of those combined are over 75% of the emission sources. Um, and so, you know, if you ask, ask them why they robbed the bank, that's, that, that, that's where the money is. So we need to look at where the emissions are coming from and really focus attention there. Next slide, please. So to unpack a little bit on, on the methods, there were really three new pillars of what our CLCPA brought forward. You know, most governments nationally and internationally um, they use IPCC framework of approach. It, it's a hundred year global warming potential. We've shifted to a 20 year. Um, they also look at the direct emissions within a, a geography. We've expanded that a bit. Um, and they take a different framework when they look at biogenic resources. And, and uh, those are biofuels, you know, such as um, uh, biodiesel and, and renewable natural gas. And so we've taken different approaches through this work because of, the, of what is in our CLCPA. Um, so the first one is the global warming potential. And you'll see this this chart on the right. By definition, CO2 hasn't changed, but methane has grown threefold. Um, and so that's a really important new weight that's been put um, on how we do our accounting and, and how we're going to be looking at emissions. When we look at biogenic resources, we now count them in our gross emissions. So traditionally through the IPCC, you would look at biogenic uh, emissions as by definition net neutral. In this case, we're looking at what comes out of tailpipes and out of smokestacks when they 
combust biofuels, and we count those as part of our overall gross emissions. And the third are the upstream emissions, and we are we've done life cycle counting to look at the fuel cycle of all fossil fuels in the state and have now incorporated those upstream emissions. Next slide, please. So just to unpack what that means. Um, so this one's going to be a bit tough probably in the room, so I'll try to walk through at a high level what some of these numbers are showing. So this is a look at what are the impact on fuels. And this chart you'll be able to look at afterwards, but what we have here are fossil fuels and their typical corresponding bioenergy product. Um, and the first column shows the, the old accounting. Um, and so that looks at smokestack emissions from natural gas, for example, are at 117 pounds per MMBTU. And its, its commensurate RNG was nearly zero. So that was the old accounting. When we look at our, our, our new accounting, we see that we've now taken into account upstream emissions for natural gas. And there's a range here because of uncertainty. We are, we are assuming the upper end of that range for this analysis, given the uncertainty and how methane might be counted. So in this case, natural gas is around 215 pounds per MMBTU. When we look at how, to, how the law specifies how to do bioenergy, what it says is to look at what's coming out of each of the, the smokestacks and tailpipes. And so instead of being zero, RNG is 117. And so on average, what we see is that bioenergy products still produce on the order of 20 to 40% of, of, of an emission re, re reduction compared to their fossil fuel counterparts. Uh, but that's a fairly drastic difference than how we've looked at bioenergy in the past. Um, the other point I would say is this accounting framework is how we look at gross emissions. It doesn't specify, though, how we might treat bioenergy within specific programs and policies. So there could be programs that look at netting out certain uh, uh, specific fuel cycles for bioenergy, depending on what those feedstocks are. Um, so it doesn't preclude specific policies and programs deciding how they want to look at the life cycle of different bioenergy products. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is a very quick look at the upstream emissions. It's really just to give you a sense of of how upstream emissions have changed our worldview. Uh, we've seen emissions have increased by 30 to, to 40%. You'll see by the pie chart, those uh, dashed lines give you a sense of how each of the sectors have grown. You'll see that, for example, that the orange yellow of, of buildings has grown more than the blue of transportation. It's because we see more, more proportionate natural gas being burned in our buildings than we do in our cars. And so when you look at upstream uh, methane emissions, we see that that will grow more. And so that's why buildings, which used to be more of a second order to our transportation, are now co equals. Um, and on the order of 40 to uh, 70 percent of those upstream emissions are methane. So that's really a multiplicative effect. We now count upstream methane emissions and use a 20 year global warming potential. Um, so again, this is a pretty good visual, I hope, to give you a sense of how our emissions have grown with these new factors. Next slide, please. So this now rolls up, um, and what we've stacked up here in the different columns, the first column was our old accounting that we showed you all last year. Um, we see that you know on the order of 70 million tons is added simply by increasing our global warming potential factor. We have an additional roughly 10 million tons that gets added by now counting bioenergy in the state. And then we have an additional 90 million tons when we look at the upstream emissions. So we've nearly doubled what our perspective carbon footprint is through these new factors. Next slide, please. Okay, so before I dive into the reference case, I'll pause here. Um, I, I do want to, you know, we're going to have, I think, some more deliberative discussions at the end, but any clarifying questions just as we're level setting on kind of the uh, new rules of the road. Yep, please. One, one quick question. One of your slides showed uh, feeds of methane emissions are separate from all of the sectoral energy uses. I would have thought that all of the methane could be attributed to one of the sectors. Yeah, so great question, and, and I'll, I'll try to give it back for the audience. Um, so there was a question about why fugitive emissions that are in state are counted separately um, from the other emissions that are upstream. Um, and so what we've recognized is we're basing it on a couple of principles. One is attribution. And what we wanted to do with the in-state fugitive emissions is think about how can we attribute those and when you marginally change the use of natural gas at your burner, it doesn't change the pressure and the lines in the state. And we're still going to see those actual fusion emissions happening. 
So changing marginally what happens at the burner won't get at those emissions. We need separate policy mechanisms that we in the state can control to go after leakage in the state. So that's why in-state fugitive emissions get their own category. And what we've done is we've layered in the upstream out of state because that's really what we're being asked to do by our CLCPA. We don't control what happens outside of the state. I can't write a policy to go after it. But we thought it was important to think about how we attribute emissions and then what policies could drive those actual reductions based on the physics of the system. So, so the fugitive emissions are, are simply the in-state fugitive Exactly. Exactly. We've carved those out because we want to be able to target them. Any other clarifying questions? Okay, next slide. Oh, no, we're already here. Reference case. Oh, sorry, New York City. I don't want to forget about you all. Any clarifying questions? Can can you can you hear me? Okay, we'll keep moving and we will definitely no, no, shrink no. the view. Clarifying oh. question. Can you hear me? Yeah, please. Sorry. Okay, sorry. Oh, <laughs> I guess this is being recorded. Yeah, yeah. So the posterity. current emissions, Wait, you, we you... purposely call them current. So they're based on so, 2018. I think there data. is a question. CDC is currently um, working on 2019, uh, which will be published as part of our, our draft inventory by the end of year. Can they but not we hear recognize you? that you know when you no, pull together economy-wide data, there tends to be a it. substantial oh, lag. So what we've asked our analysts to do is give us a little bit of a forecast so we can, you know, where we have 2019 data, let's let's put that in. So we've called it current because it's not one specific year, but it's the most current that we could get. Yeah, I think there's a question. It's a New York City question. Okay. Maybe if you can speak into the computer, we'll be able to hear you. You might still be on mute. Can you hear us now? Okay, yeah, or you can use the chat. Maybe Sarah can help me. All right, and I can, can if, you if you can hear me, set chat. Oh, can, can they okay. not hear? Can you hear? Maybe oh. I need to put it in the chat. So we can hear remotely. <laughs> can you hear us? Did you try this microphone? So I think we're. We're having, okay. Can you oh, hear me now? Okay. So unfortunately in Albany, we're not able to oh. hear New York City right now. So if you could put and, and questions can, into the, the chat. And they'll they can get back to it later. I think perhaps in Albany, have you muted your listening? Well, then you wouldn't be able to hear me. I think Albany might have muted inputs. Ah. I think we might begin to hear you. Maybe turn up. Can you hear us now? Yes, we can. <laughs> I can hear you and then I will try to repeat it. <laughs> well, thank you so much. And I ap apologize. For, well, you know, I know we're doing the best we can. So yes, what I can appreciate the amount of work. Fascinating. I see, you know, fascinating presentation so far. Um, I see there's been and, and you spoke a little bit to why there's been so so much change. And I thought if you could give just like a high level to, to sort of explanation um, of, of why why there is such a, a difference in particular with regards to waste. I see that there's been a, a big expansion there. Um, and if so, if you could just give us like that high level into to why some of this change has been so significant, I I, I would appreciate that. And, and, and if you're about Yep, no, we can hear you, which is great. Thank you. Um, so, so the question was, why are we seeing such a large change in our emissions based on these, these new methods? And, um, and in, in particular, waste um, was uh, recognized that it's taken on new importance. Um, and so the key drivers here are, we are now um, multiplying methane by three. So in our old accounting, we had a global warming uh, potential factor around 30, which means that methane was 30 times more powerful than CO2. It's now around 90. So anything that produces methane will now have three times uh, an amplification on its emission. And so waste is a prime example. And I have a slide later, which, which shows our waste sector. Um, it's predominantly landfill gas emissions, which are mostly methane. So that, that's a key driver. And then the secondary one is we're now counting upstream emissions. And so to try to explain that in a different way, 
when we look at a fossil fuel that's burned, um, so for example, uh, uh, your gasoline in a car, you know, it's roughly 160 pounds per MMBTU out of that tailpipe. But now what we've done is we've done detailed analysis to look upstream, said, how is that oil actually being turned into gasoline? Going back to the actual wellhead where there can be fugitive emissions from that well, and we're now counting that total fuel cycle. And so we go from roughly 160 to now over 200 for gasoline. So it's really a, both factors treating methane um, under a different protocol and then counting upstream emissions. Hopefully that was helpful. Thanks. Thanks. And we can't hear you, but uh, I will assume silence means yes, um, unless you can see something in the chat. I'd like to make a comment. Can you hear me? Is there another question yeah. from the uh, New York City? Is that Paul? Okay, yeah, go for it, Paul. Yeah, can you hear me now? Barely. No? Maybe you get a little. Barely. I think you're going to have to stand. How up. about now? <laughs> There you go. The class professor. Yeah, do it. <laughs> right, right. Use your lecture voice. <laughs> go ahead. I, I just uh, I'm going to repeat myself from previous meetings, but there is a cautionary tale here for us in, in terms of how we move forward over the next several years, because the accounting we're seeing here that the way we're doing the accounting using the 20 year time scale for methane has a big impact also the upstream uh, source emissions where we are including that's having a big impact so we have to do the accounting using the best available science and and that's what we're looking at but the science is rapidly evolving. So among the things that we know is that there are large currently unaccounted for emissions of methane in urban environments like New York City from the natural gas distribution system. The EPA methodology for for accounting for uh, for um, doing the methane part of the emission inventory is not aware of that. It doesn't incorporate the developing knowledge. And so while it appears that the waste sector is a, a very significant part of the total, the natural gas distribution part of the total from methane is going to grow over the next year or two as things get um, published in the peer reviewed literature. So this is just sort of a cautionary tale that that we will we the Climate Action Council in New York State will have to be prepared to deal with a continuously changing knowledge base that impacts the the accounting results. It, it, I'm just reminding us that that there is an important part of the methane uh, accounting that is. It, that is quite significantly underrepresented relative to the, you know, rapidly developing knowledge in the measurement science community. It just, this is not going to be, the accounting we do this year will not be fixed. Mm -hmm. Just a comment. And, no, thank I, you. Mark. Also, uh, just this, uh, a, a, a note on this. Thank you so much for that. I know, um, Mr. Sagos, I know the, the accounting, the guidance to agencies on on some of these issues um, discusses this, discusses the evolving research and the need to take that on and continuously update. And it sounds like we're beginning to have updates already. It, would you think that that's the case? Uh, yes, I mean, I think that's that's accurate, Raya. Um, I mean, we need to continuously update this. So, absolutely. Right. Yeah, I think both bo both points are actually uh, consistent with a the theme I wanted to bring up later, which is this is not once and done. I think that this council knows that the science is evolving on a number of fronts. I think uh, methane emissions from our distribution system are one example, um, and that we need to have both a an adaptive approach to the process as well as the policies. So, thank you for both of those comments. Okay, for the reference case, oh, sorry, one more question in the room. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. So DEC actually. Oh, sorry. So, so the question is, what what is the basis for this uh, new accounting system that I'm showing here? This is building off of the work that that DEC actually did and published as part of their limits rule at the end of last year, and then they've had a few uh, uh, workshops over this, I would say, winter spring, um, where they've discussed bioenergy accounting. Um, and some of these uh, uncertainty around methane. So there were some very specific workshops, but it's been part of that process and it will all culminate at the end of year in the inventory. I don't know. Yeah, and, and if I could just jump in, um, it, it is also, it, it is interpreting or, or directed by the language of the statute. So the 20 year global warming potential for methane is required by the statute looking at upstream emissions, including upstream emissions from fossil fuel generation is required by the statute. Um, there's- I understood that, I just yeah. didn't know that. Yeah, so they were, right. So again, the, that work product was already in, you know, uh, uh, DEC published it through their technical conferences and the, and the basis for it has been, you know, the upstream emissions, for example, we have consultants who are looking at full life cycle analysis, leveraging tools similar to California. So GREET model is kind of one very common platform that we've made a New York version of that to be able to look at our specific upstream emissions. Yeah. So, yeah, so so we were consistent with IPCC accounting, except where the CLCPA specified that we should diverge, and those were in those three main categories. So everything else is consistent. But we previously used the IPCC. Last last June. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Perfect question. So we, we have some I have some slides coming up. That, oh, sorry. The uh, question from the room was, how, how do we think that the new CLCP accounting will affect outcomes, both for our uh, uh, reference case and our and our uh, mitigation policies? And that's part of what I'll be showing you on future slides. All right. I was just going to I was going to make an anecdotal comment that this is big news and sounds like really great work to, to sort of include what sounds like a real sea, a consequential sea change, but to keep us up to date like that. So Great. thank yeah. you. Yeah. Uh, of course. Yeah, just a point of clarification or two. Mm -hmm. When you say the IPCC approach, I, I should point out that that's the IPCC approach in the 20th century. And the most recent synthesis report from the IPCC, the fifth AR report, which is from 2013, already eight years old, Stated explicitly that once it's not the IPCC. So when the state of New York two years ago passed the CLCPA for the 20 year, it's not like it's in any contradiction to the IPCC. And I want to make sure that people understand that. Mm -hmm. What it does is say that we know more now than we did 25 years ago in the 20th century when the first IPCC report came up. But I also wanted to comment on the use of the, of the Greek model because the CLCPA specifies that in the greenhouse gas accounting that all sources of information be used, including the best available peer-reviewed literature. And I do not believe for the record that the Greek model reflects that. Yeah. And as should be to what right. Paul mm -hmm. Shepson was saying, we know that the emissions are larger than the Greek model says. And so I, I do object for the record. Right. And, the Greek model and so that I don't um falsely explain what DEC's detailed work was, Greet was one input. Um, but not the only input. Great model, in my opinion, is low relative to what peer reviewed literature would suggest. Okay, thank you. So sometimes you do here. Yeah. Um, when the the, um, uh, the computer speaks, if you could put the uh, microphone next to the output from the computer, so those dialing in mm -hmm. can hear it. Thank you, Mary. And for my next trick. 
Um, okay, so for for the reference case, we're going to now pivot. Um, and so this is a forecast. Um, and I again, I brought it forward to your attention a couple months ago, but just just to remind us. This is the first step in the integration analysis, and it forms the basis for how we look at societal costs and benefits. So we will be comparing all of our scenarios against this reference case, um, and it's a very critical step both for us to understand what existing policies get us and then how new policies um, will need to grow from that and then what they will cost and what benefits we will derive from those new policies. Um, and so we will like to term it as business as usual plus implemented policies. So what we've enumerated here are some of those extra policies that get layered on top of our traditional macroeconomic forecasts and population forecasts. So I won't go through every single one, but obviously we do start with looking at our traditional housing forecast, population forecast, but we've layered on top of it energy efficiency programs that are in the state. We've looked at our uh, federal cafe standards that are on the books and that drive vehicle efficiency. We've included our clean energy standard, which is not only, you know, that 70% uh, is not only in law, but we have an actual order in place that will fund fully our, our 70 by 30. So those are included in, in, in the reference case as current policies. Next slide, please. Hopefully you can hear me. Okay, good. So this is our first look. Again, I'm trying to take us stepwise through the evolution of our accounting. So hopefully you'll bear with me um, if it seems slow. But that bottom line was the number that we brought to you last summer. Um, and so we had on the order of 200 million metric tons of emissions. And our new reference case jumps up to around 400. And then we look out into the future with all of our existing policies, and we do see that we have a downward slope. So these new policies are driving emissions down, um, and they drive them down to the tune of around 15% in 2030, and then around 20% in 2050. So they are a step towards our ambitious goals, but we still have quite a margin to go. Um, and the and next slide, please. But I also want to note we've now put up on the screen our targets just to show you what that gap is between the reference case and our, sorry, I shouldn't call them targets, our limits. Um, and so when we look at the draft reference case under this new accounting, again, in 2030, it's a 15% reduction from 1990. I just wanted to give you a benchmark to compare in the old accounting framework in that those same policies and forecasts would have gotten us nearly 30% emission reductions. So the shift in this protocol actually means we need to have more ambition. So we not only have to go after these new sectors in new ways and maybe reprioritize, for example, waste, we also have to be more ambitious in their reach. Um, so there's, I wanted to, I hope that's clear that both we are seeing some strong uh, downward slope because of our existing policies, but there's quite a bit of space we have to fill and the new accounting practice actually raises the bar on our ambition. Next slide, please. Okay, so now I'm going to try to quickly walk through because I know we're a little bit short on time. Each of our sectors, I'll just highlight. A, um, and again, this is for our uh, our reference case, and maybe I'll do one fact per each. Um, and so clearly, for our transportation system, uh, driving patterns, uh, vehicle miles of travel, you know, vehicle ownership are some key drivers. We do have fuel efficiency standards that are helping to, uh, to lower our emissions. You see downward slope. And in our existing policy suite, we are driving an adoption of electric vehicles. So that's what that small wedge on the bottom of the top chart shows. Um, even with those very ambitious policies, we do see in 2030, we're only 1% lower than 1990 levels. Um, and so we've seen a, you know, a countervailing force of more driving um, and larger cars that have helped to bring up some of those emission sources. So transportation has, an, um, in some ways, the hardest of all of the sectors because they've seen substantial growth since 1990, with the exception of the HFCs, which I'll, I'll get to last. Next slide, please. So our building story, um, we can see that there is a downward slope to both emissions and energy driven by our, our energy efficiency programs. Um, we do see that we are over time going to be transitioning out some of our more expensive liquid fuels, but they are still out into the future in our reference case. 
with all of the layering of those policies, we're realizing in 2030 uh, a little over 10% emission reduction from our, our 1990 levels. So it great, gives us a great starting point, um, but clearly we, we have a fair amount of, of space to fill with our, our, our building's policies. Next slide, please. Business as usual, exactly. Okay, electricity generation. So this is an interesting story. Um, we've had incredible efficiency over time, um, and you'll do see a flat to downward slope in our traditional forecast for electricity. But the large green wedge is what our new transportation policies are going to bring into the grid, given our current policies. So we do think that we will see in the near term business as usual, a, a, a continued downward pressure on our electricity system, but then it will begin to grow. Obviously, we think it will grow significantly more when we bring on new policies. Um, in, in the next slide, I'll unpack what we see as the uh, generation, but this enumerates all the key policy levers that are now not only in law, but also in, in our orders. And so that includes nine gigawatts of offshore wind, six gigawatts of solar, um, and then obviously our complete march towards 70 by 30. Um, next slide, please. Not in the reference case, because we do not have an order yet. So this is our generation mix. And what you see is business as usual, we expect a dramatic transformation in our grid. Um, from our, our current system today, which is around 55% uh, zero emission, we, would, we expect by 2030 to be at a 90% a zero emission grid with our existing policies. And what we see is the major growth areas are offshore wind and solar energy. Um, and so really it's the incredible resources that we have in our oceans that we're going to be able to capitalize on and the incredible price decline of solar that we see solar growing. You'll even note solar grows beyond 2030 on its own. So we do expect there will be some degree of economic solar out into the future. Obviously, that's not a zero emission grid yet. It's 90% and if load grows, we're going to have to add more resources, but this is getting us a, a good deal of the way. And I hope it makes it clear, and I think this is consistent with some of the discussions we've had earlier in the day. We see our system is going to be dominated by wind, water, and sun, full stop. The rest of the resources are going to make sure that the lights stay on 24-7, but this will be a wind, water, and sun-dominated system. Yes. Yeah, so, so the question was, what is the role of uh, nuclear in this reference case and as it contributes? Um, so our reference case assumption actually is that each, India, each um, nuclear plant will close at the end of its 60-year uh, license. So there is a, a licensing step down over time. There will be different levers to pull when we look at mitigation. You know, the, the loss of those nuclear plants does present some challenges for the system, both operationally and in terms of erosion of the zero emissions, but that's what our reference case shows us. So any additional growth of nuclear, we will then quantify the costs and benefits of that. Yeah, so so what we forecast, one of those, so, oh, sorry. Yeah, so this question, oh, right, let me say who it is. Sorry, I'll, I'll try to juggle better. So that was Ann Reynolds who's asking this question, why do we see a gap between our load dot and our generation dot? And so that's imports to the state. So we see over time, business as usual, will be importing energy more from outside. Um, and that would predominantly be fossil fuel generated because we'd be looking at what's the marginal resource coming from other states. So part of what we're looking for in our scenarios is how do we have 100% zero emission 24/7 in terms of like in terms of the full year. Uh, this is New York City. Can you hear me? Sorry, one moment. <laughs> one more question in the room, and then I'll turn to you. Go ahead. Sorry. I was gonna say. Testing, testing. No, it's not. Us. We can hear you, but if you can pause for one second while I take a question in the room, and then we'll go to New York City. Right. 
so it, this is an important question and it's a good just to make sure that we are level setting what we're seeing. This is our reference case. So it, and, and the question was, does this include our 100% target? And are we importing more under that? And so the question is, the answer is no. This is only 70 by 30. This does not include the 100% yet. Um, so this is a kind of a future without any controls on what those emissions are looking like. Or can you get at it in a cost efficient way? Right. I don't get the answer that now, but I think it's important. Right. Right. So that was more um, just a follow up point that we need to look at the costs and benefits of each each of the policy layers, including electricity. So I think there was a question from New York City. Oh, I'm afraid we can't hear you yet. Can you hear me now? Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Um, if, when you you talk about hydro water, th this chart assumes what we currently have, doesn't assume closing, but assumes more hydro for the future or not? Yeah, good question. And so this reference case assumes um, a small growth in hydro from hydro imports. So no, got yes. it. Got it. Yeah. And what about nuclear? Yeah. So, um, and for those who can't hear the question, there was another question about role of nuclear here. So again, this is our reference case, which is our business as usual with existing policies. And so, just just to reiterate, this is not a full mitigation scenario. Those will come next. Um, and to the question about nuclear, so in this business as usual reference case, what has been assumed is that each of the units will will retire at the end of their 60 year license. And therefore, we'll need to see if additional policies would be needed to extend them further. Gotcha. All right, I know this is dense, so go ahead. Yeah, so there was a question on kind of what is the um, the state's posture on or a statement on the kind of on uh, nuclear energy, um, and so we we currently subsidize. We don't control as a state the the uh, our relicensing process, and so correct. We don't have an option to push forward any relicensing, um, and I think so. We're currently need to be at at the receiving end of that process. Um, and currently, our ZEC program is only through 2029. Yeah. I'll try to reiterate. But the public service commission is going to still have to take up the topic of 100% by 2040. Right. So we've taken up 70 by 30. We know how we'll get to the, that point. The fundamental question here is what? Resources will count toward 100 by 40, and what policies might we implement to realize that? That's not reflected in this reference case. Correct. So, to, just to reiterate for those on the WebEx, uh, Doreen Harris just wanted to clarify that the 100 by 40 policy has not yet been uh, taken up uh, 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 by the Commission. And so, that is a future process that is not incorporated into the reference case. All right, I think we're having fun. Next slide, please. Please. For those that aren't aware, there are four remaining nuclear plants are void and have a need for corporate ownership and structure. And the issue of the future beyond 2029 clearly will be part of that record and the desire of the new owner or refurbished owner and what their intentions are will be well known this year. <laughs> okay, so to try to restate uh, what what the chair of the PSC just wanted everyone to be clear on is there is um, there are going to be some new ownership of our nuclear fleet in the state, 
and we should have some clarity on that later in the year, which will help to inform future policy making. Okay, so I'll try to quickly step through these other sectors because I think people are probably excited to see beyond the reference case. Um, I guess I don't need to do that. So when when, when we look at uh, waste forecasts, um, what we see is um, we have a historical trend of population growth and and therefore driving landfill emissions. Um, what we've seen in looking into the future is fairly flat emissions from our waste system, but fairly sizable on the order all told of around 50 uh, million metric tons, where the largest category is landfill. Uh, uh, um, uh, 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 CH4, which, which is methane. Um, just in terms of what we've seen from 1990, our uh, reference case does achieve a, a moderate reduction of around 10%, um, but we still have a, a fair amount of progress to, to make in the waste system. Next slide, please. Okay, so industrial processes and product use. The main story here is, is the product use, and that's HFCs, which are a highly potent greenhouse gas. They are in all of our air conditioners, um, and we barely had any of them in 1990. So we saw a massive increase in the use of HFCs since then, um, and we see that that emission source is on the order of 30 or, you know, between 20 and 30 million metric tons. Um, and this will be an important um, um, source for us to think about, considering that heat pumps into the future will also potentially use these uh, these same gases. Um, and so that's a combination of both federal and state policies that we'll have to bring forward to think about how to deal with this large source. Next slide. Okay, ag, forestry, land use, AFALU. Um, and so what we see from our agricultural emissions um, is we have seen a decrease since 1990, again, on the order of 10%. So still um, room there for us to, to look at further reductions. The two largest sources are manure management and animal feed. Um, and so those will be important agricultural processes for us to think about. Um, we have seen an erosion of our forest sequestration over time. And so one of the activities of this council will need to consider how do we turn that curve and change the slope so we can grow our forests and look at other natural working lands options to grow our, our net sink. Next slide, please. And then I think we're at the last of the reference case details. So our, our industrial energy, we do see with growing economic activity that we will potentially have more energy use in industry. We need to keep in mind it's a fairly small slice of the overall footprint, and we've seen a dramatic drop in emissions since 1990 on the order of 40% is what we forecast in, in 2030. Um, so we have a fairly efficient industrial system, um, and obviously we need to think about um, how can we grow our, our jobs in our industry while decarbonizing, um, but as a state footprint, it's a fairly small piece of the pie. Next slide, please. Oh, this is the last one. So this was an earlier question about fugitive emissions. So we've looked at in-state fugitive emissions as their own source. Um, we have seen that there has been a, a, a significant reduction through the various uh, safety and industry-based protocols, and we've, we've reduced fugitive emissions around 30% since 1990. It's still a meaningfully large sector at over 10 million metric tons, and we need to think about both in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions, but also safety and profitability. How do we keep that, that methane from leaking out of our pipes? Okay, next slide, please. So this is similar to what we saw before, reference case and, and limits. Next slide, please. And just to remind ourselves, we have a gross emissions goal of 80, at, at a minimum of 85%. Next click. And we also have a neutral carbon neutral goal, where we will look at potentially our natural working lands carbon sink to be able to help us meet our net goals. Next slide. Okay, so pivoting now to the forward looking policies. Um, so what we've done, as I said, is we've run a, a test case looking forward at our, uh, our mitigation scenarios. And um, what we've highlighted on this slide are some of the, the largest and most important levers that came out of our advisory panels. So everything from energy efficiency and electrification of buildings 
zero emission vehicles. Uh, we've looked at the the 100 percent component of the law, a 100 percent zero emission grid. Um, there were some aggressive policies and ag, forestry, and waste. Next slide. And so in this test run, um, as I said, we've, we saw that there was a, a, uh, a dramatic decline, but as you're not surprised, because each of the panels have already come before you, individually, they didn't fully achieve those limits. And so when you add them together, they, they obviously won't. Um, and so what they lay before us is, um, is what, what do we need to do next in order to take our next step and realize our full 40% and 85% limits? Next slide. So this graphic shows you where we got, where we realized through this test running combination. And what it really outlines is that additional mitigation actions are, are going to be required. And that will be the work of this month, next month, and that we'll be bringing forward. And we want to brainstorm with you all of what levers do we think we need to prioritize. So just to make it clear in this test run, when we added up all the AP recommendations, it got us to roughly 30% in 2030 um, and got us to around 80% in 2050. Um, as a side note, if we had been using the old accounting system, we actually would have realized our goals with those recommendations. So we would have realized a nearly 40% emission reduction in 2030. Um, but with the new accounting system, we have that wedge that we still have to solve for. And that's the work that we're going to be doing together. Next slide. So what we've put forward here are a number of parameters or levers that we're going to be looking at in order to go deeper and in order to go faster. Um, and what I hope this tees up is a round of discussion of where the council would like to see prioritization and Sarah will help lead that. But I'll just walk through this at a high level. Um, some of the key levers that the advisory panels did pull and that we see we could go further on are, for example, uh, levers of uh, smart growth and looking at increased transit, so vehicle miles of travel reduction. We also will be able to look at the pace of how we can um, look at turning over our actual stock. Um, and so out of the gate, we tend to look at the end of life of a product. When does a heating system need to be turned over? How do we replace that with something cleaner? We may have to explore early retirement of some of our infrastructure. Um, obviously, we can always look at the options of going deeper on efficiency for both mobile and and uh, and uh, building units. Um, we should explore the availability of alternative fuels, including bioenergy, and what is the role of hydrogen, which we've had some earlier discussions on. Um, and then there will be opportunities for us to go deeper as we look at landfill emissions um, and potentially other negative emission technologies in order to fill that gap to get us all the way to carbon neutral. Um, I'll just tee up as a concept because we'll get to it another day, but we're also going to not only will we be looking at different scenarios to help flush out where do we see degrees of freedom and risk, We'll also be doing sensitivities. And so this is a 30 year look. We don't know what fossil fuels will cost in 30 years. We don't know the precise cost of technologies. So we're going to pressure test those key assumptions. And that will allow us to look at how the benefits and costs, what the uncertainty will be in those benefits and costs. So with that, I know we're a little bit behind, but tried to catch up. I'll turn it over to Sarah and we can go to the next slide. Thank you, Carl. Um, so Carl laid out um, some specific variables for scenario design here, but really what we want to do is hear from the council. Um, and, and so we have a few uh, questions teed up. Um, and, and I will say, I know this meeting has been a little bit of a challenge technically. <laughs> we, um, we would like your feedback now, but we'll also figure out a way to get your input over the next two weeks so that we can we can come back. Um, and so here, you know, are there additional uh, strategies that we should be looking at in the scenario planning? Um, so maybe think about the sector contributions, the new carbon calculations. We see that it puts uh, increased uh, emphasis on waste. Should we be looking at waste a little bit differently, for example? Uh, technology solutions, are there additional technologies that we should be adding or removing? And here, I guess I would say, um, you know, bioenergy seems to be a, a kind of a significant topic that has uh, folks on on either side of it. You know, whether we can whether we should include that in our planning or not. And so, um, 
the uh, the reference or the the mitigation scenarios assumes that um, that would be allowed. So perhaps you know we want to do a scenario that doesn't have that. Um, uh, beyond technology, uh, the timing. Carl mentioned this. When do we want to look at kind of turnover, whether it's in buildings or cars, um, and then the scope and speed of reductions. Um, looking at the different uh, speed of the initiatives um, to help meet the goals. And so these are just a couple questions to help get juices flowing. Um, we'd be happy to open it up for a comment uh, from the council members at, at this point in time. Um, and certainly if there are questions, um, we can take those as well. Right, and, and also um, I know we didn't leave a lot of time for any questions on our test case. So if there are any clarifying questions, we can certainly answer those. <laughs> we'll share the mic. This is John Howard. Regulations come, and what is really the role of the legislature? This is the issue of when ICE vehicles should not be sold. When should uh, gas fired appliances not be sold anymore? Uh, and uh, and those those things. I am personally loath to do this administratively. That means so much change in in society. And that uh, I would recommend highly at the end of the day that we make our list of those things that we believe are best done through legislative action as opposed to mere regulatory action. Do you want to repeat the statement or I can? Right. So I'm going to give a first cut just to try to synthesize back what I what I think is is the comment, and it's more about policy levers and the differences between an an, an administratively set policy versus a uh, legislatively set one. And I think, uh, and this was from Chair Howard, um, and his recommendation is for the council to seriously consider each of those different buckets, um, and that we need to differentiate in our recommendations of what maybe needs to be legislatively driven um, as opposed to something that's coming purely through a commission process or other regulatory process. Hope that captured that mostly. Yeah, and I would just add to that that the the advisory panel recommendations in some cases they did um, suggest legislation and in other cases um, it was more uh, uh, executive action or, or agency regulations. And so um, that's something that, um, that the council here can consider in terms of um, making, the, the scoping plan could include recommendations for legislation in order to meet um, the goals. Where is the, and I appreciate all this, mm -hmm. Where, where is the cost? Where mm -hmm. is what is somebody waterfall? Right. Right here today. We, we may have a moratorium on that. Do I have your timing slide? We may have no new gear. We may not be able to drive our car. And we, get, we may not be, you know, buying gas fired appliances. I just have no idea mm -hmm. like how we can make, you know, these reference decisions. We don't know what the costs are. And even just highlighting a moratorium issue. I guess without even all the complexities and the answers behind it. But what do we do? We're, we're you know, in my world, that means we're going to burn more oil and we're going to have more carbon dioxide, more air pollutants. That to me is a reference case that people, you know, I'd like to see. Yeah. You know, because I think that's real life. Yeah. So there, so the part of the question was when are we going to see costs? Um, and so that as we begin to fully understand the implications of these policy levers, we need to understand, you know, what what the citizens of New York are going to need to pay potentially, and what are also, I assume, the other side of the coin. What are the benefits of these policies? So you want to see both. Um, and so the answer is that we're developing these scenarios now, and the reason why we call it a test case is because we're not putting it forward as a final outcome. And what we want to try to do is build off of input from you all. What are the different parameters we want to test, and then we'll bring it back to you 
So our plan is in, in September, we're going to outline for you what this family of, of scenarios gets us. And then in October, lay out the full costs and benefits. Only up until that point will you be able to have the full breadth of information to then decide and continue to debate pros and cons. Question on this slide was about referencing wastes. Could you remind us what the aggressive goals for waste? I know that I could probably just have to summarize. <laughs> uh, I was just struck by how, in the business as usual case, there's no progress in the waste sector at all. And so, so for the um, all the all the recommendations in there, what did we assume for waste? Yeah, so so the question is what was assumed about waste? Was that in the reference case or in the test case? Yeah, so the I don't have all the specifics of the waste assumptions. Um, I guess I'll go back. Oh, I can't go back. Forget that. Um, the waste sector, um, they did look at at a number of policies. I don't know if, if if Sarah, you have them. I'm trying to think about what are the key levers there, or maybe I can phone a friend. Um, and I don't know if. Uh, Tori Clark, um, if you are able to unpack again what how we translated the AP waste sector um, into the various levers. The challenge before us now is not to decide all the recommendations. Yeah, so the question was, do we need to focus on waste? I think we do need ways to go deeper, but it, it's across the board. So I, if, if you recall from the presentations that each of the panels gave you, they gave an estimate of what their individual sectors were bringing forward. And we did see across buildings, transportation and waste that all three do need to go deeper. Resiliency and the uh, reliability. So again, you know, if the whole cold weather climate, being with the power source that's you know based on you know, wind, solar, um, water, as you said, yeah. Um, how how are you thinking of having the big scenarios for that? Yeah. So the uh, the the uh, question was a follow on question on looking how do we analyze the 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 uh, the reliability of our system as it goes through these types of dramatic transformations uh, and thinking about you know how our energy services for consumers going to be brought into effect um, and so there's both quantitative approaches to that but also qualitative that this council will have to lay out what are some of the risks that might be associated with the speed of different transitions Quantitatively, we are digging deep into the electric system because it is the backbone of, of our decarbonization. And so we do have models that look at what is the actual availability, you know, over 8,760 hours in the year of solar, wind, water. And we will bring forward other resources that make sure that we can balance the system and make sure that we do provide light and heat year round. Um, so, so the actual modeling framework does take into account the, the, the uh, reliability needs of, of the system. Um, and then. Right, yeah, so in terms of, uh, so what might be the needs, not just of the wholesale grid and making sure that we have power, you know, at, at the transmission level, but all the way down to our distribution system. And so the answer is yes, we will be estimating, you know, if we grow the grid, what are the estimated costs of building out our distribution system so that we can reliably get energy to each of those homes? Another question, Bob? 
But what about policies? We heard again today from the environmental justice uh, components that uh, some of them would like to endorse the CCIA, a card into the carbon tax. And, and certainly, we, some of the leadership from the assembly has said that they're waiting to hear from the climate action council as to our views on a carbon too. So, you know, I I have my own opinion on it, but I, I would love to see the scenarios tested. If we were to have a carbon of whatever. Five dollars per time, whatever number of funds you like. What would that do in terms of reaching our targets, just in terms of driving markets? Um, mm -hmm. so I'd, I'd love to see that be part of the consideration, and perhaps some sensitivity analysis with different levels of carbon taxation. Also, on the bioenergy, uh, I, I know we have diverse views on it. I, I have mixed views myself. I think it's a complicated part topic, so we can't. It's it's. We need to talk with more specificity. We're talking about growing willows on land that uh, cannot be used for crop agriculture and then turning it into uh, energy. I think that's probably a great idea. On, on the other hand, are we using land which could grow crops for humans and, and using that for biodiesel instead? I'm, I'm not sure that's such a good idea. Mm -hmm. yeah, but I, I think we really need to get into the specifics of what we're talking about in bioenergy in order to have good guidance. Okay, so two different comments from Bob Howarth. One was um, he'd like to see some discussion about the impacts of potential carbon pricing um, and to try to bring that forward as part of our scenario work. And the other one, as we explore bioenergy, um, there's a request to be able to get uh, beyond just the kind of simple name and think about what are the feedstocks and different feedstocks will have different impacts, not just on the net carbon, but also on the availability. Um, and certainly that is something that, that we do plan to, to explore is to, is to take a look at different feedstocks and really what's the quantity of uh, different amounts of bioenergy if you assume different availability. <clears throat> oh, Peter. Does New York City have any comments? We're going to pause here in Albany. Yes, I believe so. Go for it. Go for it. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um, I actually, most of my questions were answered. Um, I just was going to add in, in terms of the first comment about, gee, we should think about administ administrative regulation and legislative, and then also, and you're doing it anyway, market. And what markets can do uh, and drive human behavior. Um, and the second was, I always go to this sort of cost, cost, cost. I guess you're saying that you're going to get to it in September, but I'm presuming that you're already following this so that, I mean, just taking the grid and adapting it to the increased use or different uses, uh, if it's out of this world uh, or not, it's just not possible, you will give that to us early on. Because if we're suggesting things that are far beyond any of the, uh, the dollars that we could ever imagine spending, will it would help us make future decisions. Okay, did everyone hear that comment? Okay, thank you. Any, sorry, anyone else in uh, New York City before we turn back to Albany? Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Isn't that all right? Yes, yes. additional. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. So, I mean, this is, it's, it's tremendous. It's interesting, you know, sort of the changed accounting has shuffled the board a bit. That a couple of things I'm thinking of. One, in particular, I remember the Climate Justice Working Group and others saying that, in particular, transportation had um, recommendations that were already recognized as sort of not uh, not being deep enough. Um, so I'm, we may want to pay more attention there. Um, and my second question is, how 
can how can this address and how as we perhaps are going to need to prioritize this, can we address the question of early action on prioritizing emissions and co-pollutant reductions in disadvantaged communities? So that that somehow, and I understand that you're looking at a lot. So part of this is a question of where is, you know, where may be the public health or related analysis here. And, and, and I'm interested to know how that's being addressed, but how can we, can we have a layer where we talk about prioritizing these emissions and co-pollutant reductions as is also required by the CLCPA? Yeah, so maybe just to show active listening. So we are, I hear you that uh, transportation, it should be a priority from, from your thoughts and, and it, it's reflected back on what the Climate Justice Working Group shared. Um, and then the question was around both how are public health benefits going to be analyzed and can we look at a scenario that maybe prioritizes early action that can maximize public health benefits? Um, and so, as I think I showed, but it was many months ago, we are going to be doing a statewide comprehensive look at, at the co-pollutants for each of the key scenarios. So when we bring forward the full costs and benefits analysis, part of that will be a county by county look at the criteria air pollutant benefits of this transition. And what I hope we can do based on this recommendation would be we will see some differentiation in, in, in the timing of how those co-pollutants do or, or um, don't, don't evolve. And we can look at those through the lens of different scenarios. That's fascinating. That's great to hear. Thank you so much. I also, just as a clarifying question, and um, there, there have been some talk about biofuels and we, we cannot hear a lot of what's happening in Albany, unfortunately. So we didn't hear the question. We heard some talk about different type of feedstocks and that perhaps having something to do with it. If you could clarify that, and then yes, the idea of, you know, yes, there are a couple sides of this coin and folks who think that these should, you know, just can we have the ability to, you know, can that be one of the levers that, you know, an overlay that can be sort of changed, you can look at it with it and without it, that type of filter would be good too for biofuels as well. Great, yeah, so, so we'll is, all, yeah, let me try to clarify the, 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 the earlier point. Um, and so I think, and I, I don't wanna do a, a disservice to Bob Howarth, but I will do my best. Um, and so what what Bob had put forward was not all biofuels are, are created equal. And so while we may look at scenarios in a more binary way with and without biofuels, um, which it sounds like there's some consensus that we should be looking at both, um, we should also look at what types of biofuels are being brought into the system and they're not all created equal. Um, I understand. So that was the, uh, that was the recommendation and we do have our, we do have an ability to do feedstock differentiation. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, one more opportunity in New York City and then we'll come back to Albany. Um, so uh, following up on Raya's comments about whole pollutant uh, benefits, you know, I, I'm aware that that the calculated benefits from our planned reduction from uh, um, avoided human health impacts in New York State are estimated to be in the billions of dollars per year of avoided health impacts. It raises with me the question about the extent to which in the implementation of the CLCPA, do we have a communications plan? Are we working on a communications plan that, that I would regard as really quite important uh, in selling the cost benefit and analysis to the taxpayers in New York State. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, and I, I can take that, Paul. Thank you. Um, so we are um, we are looking at this. Um, sorry. Um, we are we are um, we are we have been talking internally that this is definitely needed. Um, it also was a recommendation from a few of the advisory panels. Um, and so we do see it as a really important job to make sure that the consumers of New York understand kind of what's what's coming at them. 
And so um, we would agree that this is um, this is kind of critical, um, and that that we'll need to engage folks and. Um, and we're looking at trying to do that, not just, you know, once the draft scoping plan comes out, but um, ideally we want to start that sooner um, and, and we'll be looking to um, to do that. Um, but we're still kind of investigating some of the, the methodologies and mechanisms that we'll, that we'll use for that. Thank you. I mean, I would just add that we all have a role on the communication side to communicate out what we're doing here. We were in the middle of an iterative process that um, is obviously extraordinarily complicated and challenging. Uh, we're, we're fighting off uh, things for the first time. Uh, really, no one is doing this to my knowledge anywhere. So um, in doing that, we have to be honest about the, uh, the ideas that are being elevated. Uh, the data that supports it and the challenges that we see ahead of us. Again, going back to point number one, we all agree, I believe, around this table that there's a problem. We all know what the targets are. We have to communicate, I think, leading up to the scoping plan draft through the six public hearings, beyond that, through the course of 2022 to the final, and then for the next 10 to 20 years. Um, and, and we will all have a role in that. Some of it will be, will be state led some of it will be organically done by all of the members at the table here who are not part of the state and then beyond um to the extent we can have some harmony on that the, the better and i know when it comes to questions about cost benefits and all that those are going to be the more the more difficult ones to communicate out um but we have to we have to acknowledge that the public is more aware of this issue than ever um, and take advantage of that awareness to educate with facts as much as possible. So we get it. Uh, there will be certainly an opportunity for the council itself to weigh in on that between now and and really uh, December and possibly multiple times. Okay. I think we're going to turn back to Albany. Any questions in the room? Peter. I would love for us to go back to where I think we were going to head in December, have a conversation about what the statute allows. Before we do scenarios, let's take a look at the statutes and say, what is, what is a bounds to what the statute allows us to do in fire? If there's constraints, I'm not sure it's worth our spending a few minutes on time trying to figure out scenario planning for where the boundaries of the statute go. Okay, so the first question from Peter was uh, before we step into our scenarios, um, he's recommending we take a step back and make sure that we have a consensus view on what our statute allows in the in terms of bioenergy use as a possible mitigation option. The second thing I would ask you is a We really double down on the expansion of mass transit and hope that we can get to a position where we wouldn't see the types of growth that uh, the original pathways report still envisioned and what I saw in the references. I can posit we fail as a council if we have more vehicles on our road in 2050 than we have done on zero energy or not because of all the societal sort of impacts that go along with vehicle ownership. Great. So the second point was a uh, recommendation that we double down on exploring how to reduce vehicle miles travel and vehicle ownership. What are going to be the societal shifts that might be brought about um, in order to not just have electric vehicles, but also have fewer of those vehicles? My last, last point is sort of so back to the question that Paul asked about homes. It's just those of us who are in the room this morning, the state actually did a tremendous body of work in 2009 and 10 with a firm called GMMB, and they were contracted essentially to do a comms look at how we engage people in the plethora of energy efficiency and other programs. And I served as Chair Howard, you could probably bring it back. 
to the commission because the commission uh, oversaw all this work. It was an amazing stuff, really, how where people are and how you talk to them about the climate crisis, the huge benefits of reducing their energy waste. You know, have that frank conversation that I think we should all be having with ourselves that in an internal combustion engine, for every dollar somebody pours of gasoline into that vehicle, 75 cents of that gunk is pure waste. When you start to have that level of conversation with the average New Yorker, suddenly they'll look at an electric vehicle saying, wait, 10 cents in electric vehicles waste, 90 cents to pure benefit. I mean, that's the level of, of uh, conversation that the current GMMB had and it was under assistance benefit charge form. They paid more than $20 million for this research. Let's go back, dust it off, take a look at it. It's good stuff. Um, so th there's a uh, recommendation to learn from the past. Um, we've done work already to, <laughs> right? That's an understatement. To uh, expand our knowledge of what, what communication strategies might work. Um, and it's kind of good common sense, yeah. But the statute, uh, I think, eloquently underscored the existing authority that EPC has. Uh, Reggie was done by administrative action. There was not a need for the legislature to tell EPC to do Reggie. I think there's ample uh, authority already provided that was um, doubled down, underscored in the CLCPA of the authorities of all the agencies. Uh, to adopt the regulations to then implement uh, what has been proposed under the scope of the Now, that's not going to stop legislators from doing what they'd love to do, right? Legislate. We actually already saw that in the past legislative session. They didn't sit back and wait for the panel discussions to, to even fit when they decided to advance legislation that said for internal combustion engines, no new vehicle can be sold in your state for passenger purposes unless it's zero emissions by 2035. So those bills have been passed. They await the, the, the adjudication by the governor. But I think the, the CLPPA gives direction and authority to the agencies to go forward. Great. So Peter's last point was that there, he would posit that there is plenty of authority exists in our, in our current statutes um, including CLCPA to give power and authority to agencies to promulgate new regulations to help bring forward some of these changes. So, um, given the time, I think maybe we can take just one last question from Anne and, uh, and then we can step into the next steps. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Test run where we prohibit all internal combustion engines make electricity 100% emissions free, and we make all buildings all electric, either new or replacement appliances, and it still doesn't get us to the goal. But here you go. So Anne's question. Right. So Anne's question is um, just to restate what the council's charge is to help us think through what levers to pull in our scenarios and where are the areas of opportunity is, I think, what you're asking to hear about. And part of the answer is we might need to accelerate some of the recommendations, which may require different forms of policy. So, for example, the buildings had certain structures that were mandates. Can you accelerate that or do you need to have a different construct? And so what the pathways analysis shows us is, is the what, right? What are the types of technologies and changes, but not the how? That's what we have to debate. And to the earlier point, how are we going to pay for it? And what are the different structures of these policies? Well, and, and I, I, if I could just just weigh in here, and, um, I would say that yeah, I'm afraid you'd have to sit in my lap. 
the earlier, the earlier helps us, the earlier helps <laughs> us get the 2030, right? To meet the 2030 target. Earlier doesn't help us meet the 2050 target. That's where those other things that you're talking about, aviation, HFC, some of those other sources that help us meet the 2050 goals. And then remember, there's also the, you know, net zero carbon. Um, 2050 goal in addition to the 85% reduction. I'm just trying to stress that uh, you actually pay attention to more transportation, but I don't have any more ideas other than we're prohibiting internal combustion engines for transportation, at least as with aviation. Sorry. My, my, uh, Question is part of my job is to spend a lot of time on reliability stuff. Mm -hmm. The things I don't think we talk a lot about is reliability. We talk about affordability and issues like that. Um, you talked about your 8760 hour analysis. What uh, reliability criteria are you, are you using to come up with the, to make those determinations? Because there are various tools out there to, to get to the reliability answer. And, you know, we're not going to have reliable electricity systems always. So, yeah. So, a very um, rich and technical question for the last one, which I'll touch upon, and then we'll get you more information. Okay. Um, and so, the question from Gavin was, "What are the, re the the reliability criteria and approach that we're implementing as part of our scenarios to make sure that 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 the lights do truly stay on?" We are using a ten in one process, which is our standard. You know. Um, protocols around um, how frequently can we lose power? Um, and we are looking again at what is the contribution over time that each resource makes towards that capacity need. And what you'll see in subsequent meetings is you will see an erosion of the contribution that certain resources can make because they are not coincidence with when the peak is. So there's that dynamic we will be capturing. And that calls for more batteries, calls for the clarion call for long, uh, long duration storage and potentially other solutions. Right, so I th yeah, so, so Donna's question was getting again at the, the question of how do we think about consumers energy services in their homes at their vehicles and how that reliability of service, you know, where they need it, when they need it may change in this transition. Um, I, I will posit that electricity today is already that, um, a fundamental need, right? Many homes actually can't heat their homes without electricity, even though it isn't the prime mover in the home. Um, so this is a question of our reliability standards even today, um, and ones that you know we will certainly adopt those current standards. And I think it's it is the right question to say, do we need to think differently about those standards in the next thirty years? I think the good news is we have time. And so we need to bring forward those issues and think about, do our standards need to shift? Um, but electricity is already a fundamental need, um, and some would argue right, and one that we have to maintain no matter what our transition looks like. <laughs> we talked about this in the last session. Uh, the state of the distribution system is in the hands of the utilities. Are we just captured? Can we just capture that information? And they, they retain historical information. They know the age of their infrastructure. They know where their constraints are, their prioritization of rebuilds, and their in each of their individual feeders. So when we need to model that, we could get the utilities to develop that uh, as a function of their agenda. 
So this was a question about being able to leverage what the utility is existing data set and planning mechanisms are and how we can best leverage that. We shouldn't reinvent the wheel. Um, and I think the short answer is we try not to do that. Um, we have already engaged with the JU, with the joint utilities. We are, we've received detailed feedback from them over the course of the winter and summer and spring on our key assumptions. Um, and we will absolutely not try to recreate distribution detailed models. We're looking at high level system models. And then I think through the course of the proceedings, including, you know, the, the um, our creation of our distribution system implementation plans. We're looking at you know, over time, how can the, the, the utilities data be brought forward to help answer the question, how do we keep the lights on? All right, and with that, um, thank you, Carl. Thank you all members for, um, for your great questions and we will follow up to um, try to get continued feedback um, on the scenario design. But if we can go to uh, the next steps slide, um, this brings us to, and one more please, it brings us to the end of our agenda, um, but just wanted to talk about um, kind of what we've got ahead of us for the, for the rest of the year. Um, next slide, please. Um, so the intention is to come back to the Climate Action Council at the public meetings in September and October to review and discuss the draft and uh, revised results of the scenario modeling. Um, but we also have an opportunity to uh, schedule a meeting for August. Um, we have uh, we've canvassed for the 23rd. Um, there we could have additional climate justice working group feedback if if that worked for that group. We could have a presentation and discussion on the updated climate assessment. That was an item that we had planned for today, but um, we had, we had uh, shifted it to make space for the items that we had here. Um, and we could also, um, or alternatively, uh, revisit the scenario planning matrix that is, you know, that will be developed out of partially this conversation and then the follow up over the next couple of weeks. So, has this gone out to, to the group yet? This calendar? Yes, it has. Okay. This calendar has gone out to the group. Um, and so, um, I guess I would just leave it that uh, unless there were any objections from members right now, that we would go forward with an August meeting. Um, and we can follow up via email in terms of um, the helpfulness of the scenario planning matrix, but it seems like that's probably a key thing that we'd want to come back to you with to make sure that we have buy-in um, before we um, go full into uh, modeling those. Um, so also in August, we do have um, our reliability planning speaker session. We've locked that down for August 2nd at 1 p.m., uh, we'll be putting details about that out on the, uh, the Climate Act website. Um, if you uh, just kind of going down uh, the rest of the, of the table here, in the middle of October, we aim to provide an initial draft scoping plan to the council members. The November meeting could include a discussion of that initial draft. Ultimately, um, we'd be looking for council member feedback by mid-November. And then the goal would be to turn around a revised draft by early to mid December so that we could so that you could act on it at a December meeting. Uh, we don't have uh, yet the uh, dates and times scheduled for the November and December meeting, but we will get on that. Um, you'll also notice uh, that we've incorporated um, opportunities for the Climate Justice Working Group to provide further input at the council meetings through November. Um, this participation is just assumed for now, um, but we're going to be working with the Climate Justice Working Group uh, to determine what that could look like and, and what works for them. Uh, I think <laughs> the, the bottom line is there's, there's a lot to accomplish uh, between now and the end of the year, and so we'll also be looking at additional mechanisms that we can put in place um, to do that. Uh, one of the first things we're doing is, uh, or that we'd like to do, is the speaker session. Um, the remaining speaker sessions that we had um, presented uh, a few weeks ago or a few months ago, probably now, um, we are thinking of pushing those off to between the draft and final scoping plan, just to give a little bit more space for folks. Um, it, it will still be important to do those, but we feel that you know, as long as it's informing the final scoping plan, that that could be a reasonable approach. We're also open to other ideas. Um, 
no, don't shoot me here, <laughs> more frequent meetings, um, uh, facilitating uh, between meeting discussions, uh, incorporating surveys and email follow ups. Um, and, and so I would just say if members have any preferred uh, approaches or mechanisms, I welcome um, you to share those with me. Um, but we'll be looking at how do we get uh, a little bit of um, progress made between the, the meetings as well to, to ensure that we have your feedback and that's incorporated into the integration analysis and the drafting of the scoping plan. Uh, so that was all I had. Um, we are over time, but um, I'm happy to open it up to questions if there are any questions. Donna? One quick question. Thank you. Um, one is, did you say that we would be able to land the chief legal aid session? Yes. Absolutely, you will be able to provide input um, on today's session. Um, we'd like to get um, within two weeks the kind of kind of the uh, the scenario matrix kind of designed so that we can come back to you in, in plenty of time um, for the August meeting. Um, but we'll be following up with you um, on that. My question was just wanted to I guess you just want to support the request. I know it gives itself a little flexibility because people may talk to their financial counsel. But any sanction can do it with supersedes. Um you know if there's some sort of of some of the membership. Great. The comment was um, from from Donna De Carolis to to the extent that we can consider the request from the business council to come present to um, to the climate action council. Um, and perhaps do it during uh, as part of one of the speaker series. Um, Donna, I will mention that I do have a follow up conversation with the business council scheduled um, to to explore that. Yep. Um, New York City, maybe? Any questions in New York City? I don't believe so. Nope, we're all good on this end. Right. Well, with that, I thank everyone for attending, uh, for your patience and dealing uh, with the audiovisual challenges, and we look forward to the next meeting. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. There we go. Boom.